roll call. Chris Marks. Steve McConnell. Mi Lin Tai. Jun Chu. Uh, Carolyn Watson. Tim Mills. Okay, um, please join us for this pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so we're going to begin with looking at the agenda, and I have a couple of items to bring up for that. Uh, the first one is pretty straightforward. I would like to remove um, 8.5 from the agenda because we didn't receive materials until the last minute, and I want to make sure that that I and the rest of the board have time to look at that and also consult with staff to get some more feedback on, on things there. So we would still be able to, to look at that um, and it doesn't affect us for the next two meetings. Sounds good. Okay. okay. Great, so we'll move that one to next time. Uh, next thing is that we have um, more, more comments than we have time for and our policy says that uh, we need to approve whether or not we want to take more than 10 minutes of comments. So we have Six, minutes. no, ten, if our agenda goes all the way to the end. Did I misread the policy? If we remove 8.5, our agenda doesn't go all the way to the end. Oh, that's true. So is everyone okay with taking all six comments? Is that all right? Yeah. Great, then we're set. That works. Um, are there any other issues for the agenda? Yes. Okay. Um, 8.6, uh, we have... This meeting's not that long, but we have a really long week in addition to this meeting. If we could cut that down to 15 minutes, that would be great. Why don't we, when it comes up, when 8.6 comes up, we'll start with 15, and then if there's okay. an issue, we'll go further. Because okay. we have to. Yeah. Yeah. Does that work for everyone? Just if we can start with 15 so we're not stuck in there for 30 minutes because we said we were going to be in executive session for 30 minutes, that'd be great. I agree. Okay, great. So that's set. Um, and, all right, anything else on the agenda? Then we're all gonna go ahead with the agenda as amended and I'm gonna take us to a Washington State Retirees um, Association recognizing all school employee, uh, retired employees. I'm just gonna read it, it's a very brief proclamation and I wanna recognize all the people who've given us service. So. Whereas the Washington State School Retirees Association recognizes all retired school employees, and whereas the Washington State School Retirees Association educates and assists retirees in meeting, and meeting in the special challenges retirement brings and works to improve their general welfare, and whereas the WSRA aids in advancing education by supporting high educational standards, and whereas the WSSRA promotes group and individual involvement in charitable projects and activities, sponsors scholarships, and maintains interest and participation in educational and community activities, and whereas the WSSRA supports and encourages retired educators to remain active in the education profession through volunteer activities associated with learning. Now, therefore, Jay Inslee, this, uh, I, the governor of the state of Washington, do hereby proclaim March 13 through 19, 2017, as School Retirees Appreciation Week in Washington, and I urge all people in our state to join me in this special observance. So that is that. Um, and I have another announcement, um, but I don't see it in here. I thought that it was gonna be included. So I will give us a little preview and then I'll give a formal piece of information at the end, but I wanna recognize that there is uh, an, uh, an outside group that Tim was awarded their superintendent award, or ag their administrator award for the year. So I will get the formal um, information about that ready and tell, tell everyone about it. But while everyone's here, I did want to recognize that he's got another honor that was come at voluntary, uh, the voluntary application of some of our employees who really wanted to point them out from our certified group of employees. So just to acknowledge that, Tim, congratulations. Sorry, I don't have the info with me in front of me. All right, so um, that takes us to public comments. Um, so I have a statement to read, um, and then can, we, we haven't approved the consent, consent agenda. Oh, I apologize. You're right. I just skipped the consent agenda. 
Anything that people wanted to pull out from consent agenda to discuss? Any issues? Okay. Um, can I have a motion to accept? I move we accept the consent agenda. Okay. Second it. All right. Any discussion? All in favor of accepting the consent agenda? Aye. 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 All right. So that's done. That takes us to public comment. I will read this and then we'll begin with our first two. Uh, first, if you would like to address the board on an issue, please limit your remarks to not more than three minutes. To maximize the number of comments we can hear, please use only the time you need to make your statement. If you are here with a group, the board encourages the group to appoint a spokesperson. You may provide written documentation to the board secretary to be included as part of the official board minutes. The board will listen to all comments carefully, but will generally not respond to comments spontaneously or without further deliberation. Complaints about specific personnel will not be heard in open session. And the board also accepts public comments submitted online and will include such comments in the official meeting minutes for the next regular board meeting following receipt of the comments. So with that said, um, I'd like to invite uh, Congregation for Kids, Susan Ryan, to come on up and um, start us out. And after her, the Youth Link Board will, will join us. Actually, I'm going to be the one that talks because I talk really fast. And we only get five minutes, so I'm going to talk really, really fast. My name is Ann Lewis. I'm also a member of Congregations for Kids. And Nancy Jacobs is our chairperson sitting over there. Um, we provide backpacks and school supplies to kids, low-income kids, here in Bellevue School District. We're really the only ones that do. We work with the school district to make sure we help the very neediest kids. We provide backpacks every other year. We provide school supplies, sometimes just the supplies only. Um, for kindergartners, we have a little picture dictionary as well. We have issues that we really need the school board to think about and resolve. Two specific names to keep in mind, two things. One is sustainability, which is from our perspective, congregations for kids. And the second one is student equity. S sustainability, we've been doing this for like 22 years. It'll be 22 in August. Um, we provide provided about 1,500 this past year, or 1,400 this past year, 1,500 we're looking to provide backpacks and or school supplies to kids in the Bellevue School District. We really want to thank Betty Takahashi, Judy Huntsberger, um, Sean in the Warehouse, and the Family Connection Center people because they're our connection to help the kids. We're all in this together. Um, the Family Connection people say how very, very important it is that low-income kids get a backpack and or school supplies. It makes them feel like they're like everybody else. And there's a handout here, there's a wonderful story on the back talking about student equity to make them feel like they're everybody else and they can learn. The second piece is sustainability. We, in the past, have given about 30 different various items depending on grade to the kids. This is like a fourth grader backpack, that's a kindergartner backpack. Um, this year we're only giving about 12 different items because it's become too complex, too crazy. And so instead of giving most of what every kid needs in their backpack, we're now going to give some of the things kids need. And so our specific requests for you are these three things that are in your handout in the front. Number one, oh, if I can find it easily, uh, provide basic school supplies. In the past, Bellevue School District had a, a room or whatever that had pencils and pens and whatever, and so if a kid doesn't have the, the paper they needed, the school could supply that. So basic school supplies. Some schools in the Bellevue School District do it, some don't. Number two, reduce, reduce the number of additional requested items that every family has to between four and seven, not the huge list, and we go through and talk to lots of grades and teachers to try and find out the list, and we break them down to fourth grade gets generally these kinds of things, but it really would help if it's limited to four to seven items, not 20. And the last is to standardize the list per grade because it takes a lot of effort on our part to go from grade to grade and talk to kids and everything else to try and figure out what most fourth graders need, what most kindergartners need, and it's really, really hard. So we're asking the school district to do those three things. And on the back, we show the list of what we've given in the past, the 30 different items. We're showing the 12 different items we're looking at giving now. We also have links to what other schools have been doing. There's some Seattle Times articles talking about that. We'd like you to look at that as well. 
And it also lists the number of congregations and, and other organizations that have been helping us in the past. And, oh, I'm only halfway through. Cool, this is great. Um, I don't know if there's anything else, if you have questions. Uh, we have been working with Judy Buckmaster. Um, I get the impression that it's gonna take longer than maybe this year to try and change, but it definitely, there was a Seattle Times article that specifically mentioned with respect to the McCleary Act, ensure equity for all children. Every school needs a strong foundation to support basic education, which includes transportation, classroom supplies, plus teachers, principals, classroom aides, et cetera. But classroom supplies are basic for their education. And it really makes a difference to the kids coming in that they look like everybody else. We, when we do these backpacks, we shuffle them like cards so that in any one grade, it's not the poor kid's backpack. They're all mixed up. They look like everybody else's. They're really sturdy, so they last two years. We try and do our due diligence and the best we can, but things are changing. And we need the support of the school board and the school district to make the changes possible. Anything else? I think we're good, and you did a good job. Oh, good, thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for your comments you. and for what you do. And you're, just to let you know, your timing is great. We do have a board discussion on equity at our next meeting. So this is relevant information for us. So thank you. Okay. If you want us to come or give you background as, as just the background, we'd be happy to do that. And we'll stay until break if anybody has questions. Thank you very much. All right, next up we have YouthLink Board. And then after YouthLink Board, uh, we will have um, Rosina Proudy. Good afternoon, members of the Bellevue School Board. My name is Helena Stevens. I'm the Family Youth and Teen Services Manager with the City of Bellevue and staff to the YouthLink Board. So I'm here this afternoon with two of my board members. Uh, first of all, to invite you all to our annual gumbo night. This is our 19th year doing gumbo. And uh, if you haven't come, we encourage you to come. I do most of the cooking, so you have to put up with my food. Um, and to also kind of give you a little bit of an update as to what YouthLink has been doing. So uh, one, we want to let you know that uh, the annual Kids Care Coat Drive collected over 3,500 coats this past season, and we have already distributed out 2,500 coats to many children throughout the Bellevue community. And the remaining coats will be going to various agencies uh, for further distributions to kind of help our children stay warm. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my board members and they can update you on our priorities and goals. My name is Zach England. I'm a senior at Bellevue High School. And I wanna tell you a little bit about the work that the YouthLink board has been doing. Um, so we've agreed this year to focus on homeless, homeless youth in Bellevue and the east side as our board opportunity, or board priority, sorry. Uh, for 2017, the YouthLink objectives are: the YouthLink board will partner with, uh, will partner and work with local youth organizations to address one homelessness. YouthLink will promote, educate, and support youth agencies focusing on homelessness throughout the Eastside community. YouthLink will create new alliances and utilize existing partnerships to achieve greater understanding for the youth, for the root cause of youth homelessness and work with impacted youth to advance change. Our second objective is career development and mentorship. YouthLink will work with a variety of local businesses to develop career and mentorship opportunities. The goal is to assist youth in career planning and address youth employment through programs such as our YouthLink University and other business mentor programs for middle and high school students. And our third and last objective is to focus on equity. YouthLink will engage in partnership opportunities with a variety of diverse youth organizations to create a higher understanding of equity issues that impact children and youth in the Bellevue area. Hello, my name is Daryl Sakiji, and I'm a uh, board member. Um, in addition to the board goals, we want to update, update you on the priorities that were listed from 450 students at the 2016 Youth Involvement Conference, which is hosted by YouthLink every year, or every other year. Um, first one is priority is employment. We want to expand access to community internship programs, 
organize job career fairs, create a website that allows collaboration with invocational organizations, and uh, take a look at educational barriers to creating tutoring programs. The second priority is safety. We like to work with uh, the Bellevue School District regarding awareness of bullying prevention programs. Priority three is transportation. Work with uh, transportation to increase awareness of lack of sidewalks in and around South Bellevue. Uh, priority, uh, uh, oh, and the other thing with transportation, increase access to counselors for student mental health uh, issues. Priority, next priority is education. More classes for students to learn adult knowledge. They'd like to know things like how to do your taxes, how to bank, and other life skills. And the last one, priority is health. More access and information regarding mental health services, drug awareness, uh, linkage to information regarding substance abuse, and the last one is increased access to assessment tools and counselors for mental health issues. All right. Thank you very much all for what you do. Thank you. All right. That brings us to Cortina Plauti, and then the next person will be Christopher Strajam. Strajam? Grashna Plauti. Did you mean me? Yes, Grashna Plauti. All Thank right. You. And I have the uh, letter for the board, and I also have a question. Uh, so the letter. And I really encourage the board to start reading about our education. And I think the outgoing superintendent uh, could be a great resource for you if he decides to do that. I would encourage you to do Leipzig Connection, Shadow Government, like I mentioned before, and also start reading on Agenda 21, Behind Green Mask, and I think then our vocabulary about equity will get more sense. There's also a book written by uh, Michael Savage, Government Zero, No Borders, No Language, No Culture. And this is the way when you uh, read the letters, not just give to the superintendent, and I explain to you why. Because legal industry is overtaking our education. This is the main point, and it has been doing it for years. So uh, when I uh, read the letter I got uh, from Bellevue, I looked at it's really some violence and maybe demoralization going into collectivism and creative destruction. These are all the notions you need to research. And again, power is in the shadow and no need to block the information I requested, and I requested about uh, uh, some cases that Bellevue School was involved, and uh, these are for the history of education, so we can look and really explore the model of collectivism under different notions, attitude, or equity is not what we as ordinary people understand. So please start reading the resources I brought. And you are looking for new superintendent. I think you would learn much more if you invited me. And I know RCW 28A405, and I think that's another thing that uh, is good for you to, uh, to get acquainted. And end point is really not important. I don't care to be uh, hired as superintendent, but I encourage you to invite me because what has been gone in, uh, going on in our education really needs to be uh, paused and we need to start unwrapping uh, what we had. My last question is uh, whether next time I can bring you uh, two links. Um, Marshall Rosenberg is a great person I would like to, uh, you to get acquainted. So I would bring two links and uh, the nice gentleman there would just click on them and I introduce so we can all listen to Marsha Rosenberg and Amtssprache. Thank you for your comments. As far as the videos go, we usually don't during the comments section wanna have transition back and forth with videos. So, but if you can send those links to the board, each one of us can benefit from watching them. 
then I so will talk about it. Idea. That's fine. I'm flexible. But you see, there is no, uh, no things that go one way. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So next up is Christopher, is it Drajan? Drajan. And then um, Benjamin Masso will be next. And you guys can correct me on that uh, pronunciation when you come up. Sorry. Hi, Christopher Drage. I'm from Newport High School, and I'm here representing 35 staff members from Newport as well. The following are excerpts of letters sent out by two local school districts to their staff and families relating to recent actions taken by the executive branch of the federal government and the impact those actions have had on students, families, and staff in those districts. Current events nationally are impacting many of our students, families, community members, and fellow colleagues. Changes to federal immigration and transgender bathroom laws and practices clearly are raising questions, concerns, and in some cases, confusion. As a caring and supportive staff, we want to respond to those seeking help or expressing fear. It is what makes the Edmond School District of 70,000 households, 20,000 students and families, and 3,000 employees an incredibly strong and rich place to live and learn. Seattle Public Schools is committed to educating children regardless of religion, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, country of origin, or a student's immigration status. We will do whatever it takes to make sure every student thrives. And I, as superintendent, want to reassure you we will do everything within our power to make sure that all of our children are safe, honored, and respected while in our care. Here's an excerpt from the letter that our district sent out. The silence from our district is deafening on this issue. It is unfortunate that recent events have made staff, students, and families worried, afraid, and confused. It's also unfortunate that our district has done nothing on a district-wide scale to ease the fears and worries of these same individuals or to help inform them of their rights. We recognize that it may be your desire to remain apolitical during this tumultuous and hostile social climate. However, we also recognize that with the uptick of crimes of hate around our country as well as locally, our students are feeling targeted. We all, teachers, administrators, and board members, have a responsibility to assure our students of their inherent value, worth, and safety now is not the time to remain silent. In December, you adopted a resolution that acknowledged our community values regarding the humanity and dignity of every person, the importance of showing compassion to each other, and the right of individuals to freedom and safety. You also pointed out our district's commitment to fostering safe and healthy learning environments, the protection of all student rights under federal and state law, as well as BSD policies and procedures, and the cultivation of an environment of acceptance, support, and kindness for all. These are lofty, worthy sentiments. The Newport colleagues that I represent believe that the district must take action. We feel very strongly that our district should join the company of other neighboring districts and promptly send out a letter that accomplishes the following three things. Number one, recognizes the impact that the executive actions as well as their recent crimes of hate have had on the lives of many in our community. Number two, provides accurate information about current laws and policies that protect students and families. And number three, disseminates resources for where our community members can turn to receive more information and support. We await your timely leadership and optimism with a sense of unity. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up, we have Benjamin. Can you pronounce that for me? Musso. And then we have Jennifer Fisher. Thank you for your time. I'm Benjamin Musso. I'm a spokesperson for Interlake High School's green team. And uh, we would like the district board to approve installation and possibly funding for hand dryers at Interlake. Hand dryers cost less money than paper towels in the long run. They are more sanitary, they carry huge environmental benefits, and they make bathrooms much easier to maintain. 
So if you'll go to the next uh, page on your handout. Uh, one of the main reasons we are trying to get hand dryers is to reduce the waste that Interlake produces. Interlake's annual paper towel usage is equal to over five tons of paper, costing an estimated $11,000 a year. Our vice principal recently notified us that Interlake produces the most waste out of all Bellevue School District schools, and paper towels clearly do not help with this issue. Uh, next page. These two pictures uh, show how paper towels contribute to messy restrooms overall. Paper towels litter Interlake's restrooms in a variety of ways, from clogged sinks to used paper towels strewn around on the ground. Some studies have shown that bacteria can breed in used paper towels. Also, paper towel dispensers often run out before the end of the day, leaving students with no way to dry hands. Hand dryers would help solve these problems and overall unhygienic environment. Next page. Interlake students were very supportive of our project. As the graphs show, about 80% of respondents to our survey said that they support installing hand dryers at Interlake. Uh, the majority wanted both hand dryers and paper towels to be made available. Next page. This brings up the question of whether hand dryers would actually be used if both they and paper towels were made available. Uh, the answer to that is clearly yes. 70% of respondents said that they would use hand dryers at least half the time. Based on this, hand dryers would actually be the preferred method of drying hands at Interlake. Uh, next page. So this is the hand dryer that we finally decided on, the Toto model HDR 101. It is energy efficient, dries hands quickly, has an air filter for good hygiene, and is very quiet. It is $320 a, a piece, which may seem pretty expensive, but it's actually pretty cheap compared to other comparable $500 to $1,000 hand dryers. Um, next page. This is a graph from an MIT study showing carbon emissions that result from each method of drying hands. As you can see, um, the proposed hand dryer would be uh, much less than the current situation. Next page. This shows the energy usage caused by each method of drying hands. Again, um, hand dryers are definitely the greenest option. Uh, next page. Hand dryers are also hugely beneficial when it comes to savings. They generally pay for themselves after about two years, and beyond that, they produce significant savings that can then be reallocated to other educational programs. After 30 years, looking in the long run, having both hand dryers and paper towels would save us almost $150,000, and having just hand dryers would save us about 290000 This graph does not account for student population growth either, which would further increase the cost of paper towels more than that of hand dryers. Uh, next page. Last, <laughs> last one. Hand dryers would cost us about $19,000 to obtain and install in all of Interlake's restrooms. And while the cost is clearly more than worth it, it's hard to ignore that hand dryers are pretty expensive. So we hope that the district can help fund at least some of this money, and we are willing to fundraise whatever other money is needed. Um, Furthermore, if we are unable to receive the full amount, we will select the bathrooms with the most traffic and install hand dryers in those. All Thank right. you for listening. Thank you both for coming out tonight. All right. Um, and we'll get in touch to make sure you have the right person and staff to contact about, about going forward with any of that. Before you leave, somebody will give you that. Um, let's see. Jennifer Fisher. Hi, I'm Jennifer Fisher. I'm the Executive Director for Bellevue Life Spring. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. On behalf of our board, our staff, and our volunteers, I invite all of you to join us for our March 30th Step Up to the Plate Benefit Luncheon. We will be featuring um, John Stanton, a Bellevue resident and Newport High School graduate, also the CEO of the Mariners, as well as um, the president of Trilogy Partners as our guest speaker as well as we're honored to have Dr. Mills join us as well. He's a board member and we're very sad to see you going to Colorado. They've gained something that we've lost. Um, if you're not familiar with who we are, we are an organization that supports the 3,700 children and their families that are living in poverty right here in Bellevue. That's one in five students. If you're not, I'm sure you're aware there are four schools where 40% or more of the kids are living in poverty. And these are children of our neighbors, our kids' soccer teammates, our coworkers, the people that service at restaurants, clean our homes, 
clean our apartment buildings. These are the children and the families that we serve. We serve through four basic services. Food, we're the organization that does break time meal time that supports children that are at risk of hunger during breaks. We also provide $60,000 in scholarships for summer school. We provide rent support and utility support, as well as our thrift shop located in Bellevue Square provides gift cards and vouchers to children that may need new clothing or has have worn clothing. So that's um, kind of the basic services. What makes us unique is we were the first nonprofit in Bellevue, formerly known as Overlake Service League. We're now 106 years old. We also don't accept any government funding. That allows us to serve those children and families living right above the poverty line. So when it comes July 1 of every year, we start out at zero and then raise, right now currently we're close to $2 million of an annual budget to support the needs of our community. So I invite you to learn more about who we are and to join us on March 30th. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for coming out. All right. Um, that brings us to the end of our public comments. I would like to say thank you to everyone for coming out to share a comment and to be here. And I also am going to take advantage of the fact that all these people who are passionate about our community are sitting here and remind you that this week is our superintendent search. And we have community forums so that you can meet each of our three finalist candidates in the mornings and evenings on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday right here in this building. So please join us and pass it on. You can also join online. So thanks, everybody. And while everyone's kind of transitioning, we'll get set up for our Bennett Elementary and uh, Bellevue High change order. All right, Jack, you're up. Okay, item 4.1 is Bennett Elementary replacement project. It actually is not a word of contract. It is a change order number two. We're seeking approval for this. And basically the five items in change order two um, are all dealing with the unsuitable soils and the um, other types of uh, cement treatment that we've had to do to stabilize some of the soils under the field. Um, Bennett has been a uh, challenging site as far as poor soil conditions and knowing that going into the project then it's been further exacerbated this year with the amount of wet weather we've had and uh, so on so we've had to take some um, other extraordinary measures to be able to uh, keep the project moving ahead so we can go ahead and be able to open the school for next uh, next fall so that's part of the push here now is to be able to go ahead and again, a couple of weeks ago, we did a similar type thing where we also had some additional costs for some of the site stabilization and so on. So this change order too, basically is all dealing with the remaining items that we didn't have priced when we brought the other change order in because it was important to us to make sure that we could go ahead and pay the contractor for the significant dollars that they have tied up in the, in the project. So. We are seeking approval of change order number two and the additive amount of $354,759. Okay. Does anyone have any questions about this one? Thank you for providing the comparable, um, the capital projects outlined so that we can sort of see where the prices and things stack up. That's helpful to have. Um, if, oh, go I'll go ahead and move that we approve Bennett change order number two. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Next. Okay, and the uh, second item is uh, change order number one. This will be the only one for the Bellevue High softball field, batting cages, and storage building uh, project. Again, part of this is driven by our Title IX, Title IX um, uh, report and investigation that we did a few years ago to uh, provide equity as far as both uh, male and female sports at the high school level. And so we've been uh, systematically going through the high school facilities, doing the same type of storage buildings at each of them. We developed a model for that. And so each school gets the same type of thing throughout the district. Um, Bellevue High received a um, synthetic turf uh, softball field, uh, new dugouts, uh, um, new uh, storage uh, building and covered batting cages. And then while we were doing that project, we wanted to go ahead and add a storage facility shed to the baseball, boys baseball, and also covered batting cages. So those have been done and it is commensurate with what we have at Interlake High School and also Newport High School. So um, 
last one that we have that we'll be working on will be Sammamish, and we'll be doing that hopefully this spring and summer as part of the final phase of that project. Okay, does anyone have questions on this one? I have one question, just a point of clarification. It says that this is change order one, and then the items listed are change item number four, five, six. I'm wondering, where is one, two, three, and how did they get approved, or did they just, I, I'm just wondering about the logistics so I understand what it is we're passing. Make sure okay, I Yeah, the change it. orders are tracked by a numerical item that's listed per the contractor, and some of those, even though there is no cost, it may be as a change in, in the scope of the work, and so once everything is done, the subcontractors say, hey, there's no cost, we were gonna do this, now we're doing it this way. So there are some things that are a no cost item, and there are a couple cases where, uh, not in so much here, but a lot of times there'll be a credit involved with that as well that will be deducted from so the So the ones that are missing, that out of sequence, just mm -hmm. probably have been, were no Have cost. been handled either as no cost items to the owner. Thank you. And just to be clear, you're saying, Jack, the change items roll up into a change order? That's correct, so this makes up change order number one. Yeah, these are all the components of that. Okay, any other questions? I move that we approve Bellevue High School change order number one. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right, that takes care of that. Thanks, Thank Jack. Um, and that brings us to our reports, and I want to acknowledge and appreciate that we have a PE and health report we won't be hearing from tonight. It's a written only, but I wanted to appreciate the folks for submitting that and let them know that if any board members have questions after tonight, they will send them um, to, to uh, the superintendent to make sure we get answers from you on that, but thank you. Um, next, we're gonna go and hear from the Boys and Girls Club, one of our community partners. Tonight is community partner night. This is really nice highlighting um, what a great district we have with so many people contributing. that is community partner night and you have been addressed so far by two community partners. Three, Three actually, yeah, that's right, Youth Link too. Um, so here with us tonight from um, Boys and Girls Club of Bellevue is Ryan Scott, the COO and Vice President, and I believe he's been with the club about mm, 20 years now? Oh, yeah, it's about 13 here in Bellevue. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right, 13 here in Bellevue. And this is Iana Shabanova. Shabanova. Shabano, um, and Yana is a student at Sammamish High School. She hails from Lake Hills in Odal. And um, <coughs> we just realized that we were there at the same time. And Lance Latimer, Haggard. Matt Haggard. Yep. Lance is gone now. I knew that. Yep. <laughs> Matt Haggard, who has been with the club also in a variety of positions and is currently the director of the Be Great Graduate program, which is one of the programs that they will highlight for you tonight. So All right. take it away. Well, thank you for uh, the invitation to speak, and thank you for uh, what has been a long partnership with the Bellevue School District. Uh, I thought I would take just a couple of minutes and give a just kind of a high overview of uh, the Be Great Graduate program, and then defer to two people who are much more interesting um, when it comes to the the, the, um, the program itself. But, uh, as you know, I mean, we the Boys and Girls Club has a long partnership with Bellevue School District. We've been in schools now for. Uh, more than 20 years and serve just about every elementary, middle, and a number of high schools through our programs. Um, you know, the Be Great Graduate program is one that we wanted to come and specifically speak a little bit about uh, because it's very unique and we're doing some we're doing some really great things and I have a great example of the great things that we're doing here. Uh, you know, this program started about 2009 and this was about the time uh, Boys and Girls Club looked at expanding teen programming into the Lake Hills neighborhood. Uh, at that time, we purchased the former Lake Hills Library, converted it into a teen center, and started running programs. And about that time, we started talking about dropout prevention and what can we do to support kids, particularly in East Bellevue, that were at risk for, drop out, for dropping out from high school. We were approached by a local uh, foundation, had this really nice kind of two-week conversation, all of a sudden we had a program and off we went. Uh, we grabbed some juniors and seniors in high school, said let's get them through high school, and realized very quickly that that intervention was much too late. Uh, and the program focus uh, shifted significantly more towards the middle school time. Um, as the program grew, uh, we have deepened our partnership with the school district uh, and also engaged the local housing authority as a great partner. Um, we have three elementary school sites in King County Housing Authority properties. And then 
with this uh, site in Lake Hills, all of our King County housing residents uh, utilize the Tune Center. We provide programs free of charge. Um, at, you know, as we really understood that this middle school was the place we needed to be, uh, we were approached and engaged by the Gates Foundation, who made an investment in uh, part of the middle school program called Club 678, or sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And um, you know, really, the goal of this program is to support kids. Uh, as they transition from elementary to middle school and from middle to high school to really, uh, you know, have a great uh, academic experience and have a plan to go do something great afterwards. Uh, so the structure works where we're, we're working with school counselors on a daily basis, uh, you know, Matt and his, and his, you know, his peers um, to, you know, and the local housing authority to identify those students who really are at risk for whatever reason uh, of not graduating. And then our staff work with them very individually to understand and eliminate any of the barriers that may exist between them and graduation and help them understand and develop a plan for what's next. What is that next step that you're going to take? Um, we found this to be very effective. And you know, with the help of the school district, we've, we really developed a framework of what are those indicators that our staff need to be mindful of. Things like number of attendances that happen over the course of the year, um, we know eighth grade algebra can be a little bit of a sticky subject, uh, core classes, you know, what are those pieces where our staff can really uh, reinforce the priorities that are coming from the school district to ensure that it's kind of one voice being heard during school, where it's school day and after school. And, you know, just to give you a sense, since 2009 of, of, of kind of how this has worked, um, you know, we've, we've, we've supported about 500 kids through the program so far. Uh, academically, uh, what we've, I'm really pleased to say that what we found is in English, science, and math, um, you know, the kids who participate have uh, increased their GPA, about 60 to 70 percent of them have increased their GPA in those core areas. Um, one of the things that has, we're really proud of is, is we've spent a lot of time working with the school district and the King County Housing Authority on absences, and all of the kids who are participating in the, pro in the program this year are under that 10 absence threshold which we know is super critical. Um, and we also know that very consistently, um, you know, 100% of the kids are graduating and um, successfully progressing from grade to grade. So we're, you know, we're really pleased with the efforts that, are making, that we're making here. Um, you know, understanding that one of those mindful transitions is uh, the time from second, first to second semester of ninth grade where our program shifts a little bit. We not only provide the academic support, but that's really where we start to get into the um, career exploration. So working with our corporate partners, we're doing site visits. There's something incredibly cool about the November cafeteria. I don't know what it is, but it's one of the favorites every year. Um, but at the same time, they're having people from you know corporations talk to them about, here's why I'm in this field, here's, the, here's what I do in marketing. Um, you know, store visits with uh, local carriers or wh whatever it may be to really help them understand what is that light bulb moment uh, that's going to really get them to understand, okay, what's the plan that I need and then how do we work back from there. Um, you know, overall, this has been a really great partnership and we, you know, we could not be more pleased. Uh, the program continues to grow and I'm going to let Matt talk a little bit about some of the next steps that we're taking with the program. Um, and then we have uh, Tiana to kind of close things out here. Great. Um, kind of piggyback on what Ryan said, our, um, our partnerships with the middle schools, uh, particularly uh, Odal and uh, Tillicum, uh, have been a huge, you know, great success for us. Um, we have a couple staff that, that are up there during you know, pretty much every day of the week, um, uh, just meeting with kids, um, seeing how they can help with them. Um, our next step is to uh, build the same kind of partnership over at Tillicum. Um, that's another with some of our partners with KCHA. Um, another need out there that we really want to try to focus on next. Um, you know, uh, coming up to the summer is coming around the corner. Um, in the past, we've done some great things with the school district, um, helping out with uh, uh, curriculum. Um, I know they've let some classes out of our site before, uh, a couple summers ago, um, and just trying to help build that STEM uh, programs out there. Um, we have some great partnerships with Best Buy, um, kind of Geek Squad, we're doing some of those things out there. Um, so that's kind of where we're going next. Um, anything else I need to cover? I think the other priority <laughs> that we've looked at is family engagement. Family engagement. And how can we work together, understanding that family engagement can be incredibly difficult. 
uh, both from a school perspective and from the club perspective. You know, we've talked a lot about this as we were going into summer and as we start to ramp up for the next school year, how can we work more closely with the district to you know, collectively <coughs> engage families and really get that, that parent engagement that I think we're all looking for. So that's, that's a real focus area for us moving forward. Uh, but we're so pleased to be working so closely with um, the district and King County Housing Authority um, to really help us identify and make sure that we're being successful. And it's really nice that, that this partnership, uh, you know, our priorities have very much aligned with those of the district and it really has worked very well for us. So. With that said, this is Yana. Hello. Yana's going to do a little, little bit about herself and her time at, uh, during the club. Um, my name is Yana Shabanov, and I'm here today with the Boys and Girls Sub-Teen Center. I started going to the club when I was about four years old. The first Boys and Girls Club that I attended was Hidden Village. That is where I grew up, my second home. I found out about Hidden Village and the Boys and Girls Club through my aunts and uncles. They went to the club when they were in elementary school. After elementary school, I started going to the teen center. When I first went there the summer before sixth grade, I remember being terrified to walk through the two front doors because I knew the transition from what I call baby club to the teen club would be a big deal to me. My biggest fear was how I would make new friends when there were kids twice as old as me there. But what really made the transition easier for me were all of the staff. The staff helped encourage me to make new friends and grow out of the stage of being shy and keeping to myself. The first program that I got involved in was the B grade graduate program. Besides helping, with, helping me with my homework, I was required to meet with my mentor at least twice a week, although I probably met with him almost every day. During these check-ins, we would go over grades and missing assignments and come up with a plan on how I could get those turned in. They also helped me stay organized with my planner and my notebooks and provided any school supplies that I needed. Even, they even made me talk to the scary teachers when things were not going right. I did not realize at the time that my mentor had already reached out to them on my behalf to try and make it easier. Because of their help in growing my confidence, by the time seventh and eighth grade came around, I wasn't so intimidated by school or the teens at the club. That is when I became super attached to the Boys and Girls Club. That is when I felt like the teen center was my second home. After middle school passed, high school came around quickly. But at that time, not to brag or anything, I really felt like it was my time to shine at the club. Not only did I stay in the Be Great Graduate program, but I also became more actively involved in the Keystone Community Service slash College Prep program. This has allowed me to go on to, has allowed me to go on college tours. And now I serve as the president, which means I get all the power. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. It means that I can really get, I can really be a part of the big things that the group needs to get through. It gives me a bigger responsibility, which I am happy to take on any day. I am also involved in cooking club, tech lab, and wheel up. Every program that the club offers, I was a part of at some point or am currently taking a part in. By participating in these different programs, by getting homework help and bringing my grades up throughout the years, along with helping around the club, I have gotten the Teen of the Month Award at the Boys and Girls Club. I was also runner-up to the Youth of the Year Award this year, which I am going to win next year. By showing my maturity, my maturity level with these different programs that I have taken a part in, with the help of a few staff members, I have been given the amazing opportunity to go above and beyond by working the front desk for community service hours during the summer and partly during the school year. But what's even better is that I was promoted to the front desk receptionist and work three days a week, which consists of answering phones, sending messages to the staff, giving tours, assisting, assisting the staff, parents and kids with anything they need help with and more. With achieving all of these tasks through all of the thicks and the thins, I know that I will be able to graduate high school and become something of myself, something big. I'm not exactly sure what that is yet, but hey, I'm only a junior in high school who should probably start thinking about getting her life together before it's too late. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. We yeah. appreciate that. Um, so that definitely gave us some insights into how things work and, and what happens with the programs. On that note, do folks want to ask any questions about how the programs are working or how our partnership works? I had one question. I was wondering what your, um, how many mentors actually are part of the be great graduate and then how many how many uh, students do they have in partnership like we have five full-time staff that are uh, directly for lack of a better term case managing yeah for students as they go through it um, and our participation right now is somewhere between 60 and 70 students so it's it's a lot yeah um, a lot of kids that we've got involved but it's all great stuff 
And it's always one-to-one. -one. The Each student has the same uh, yes. be great, great, great mentor yeah. every time. And okay. design and mentor. And really, I mean, obviously the goal here is to become academically self-sufficient, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are different levels of engagement depending on the situation. There may be some who just need a once-a-week check-in. There may be some where it's an everyday, it's an everyday check-in. But the goal as we move towards uh, those high school years that really it becomes more just, hey, just checking in, making sure everything's okay. And, you know, a lot of that is, is self you know, there's a level of self-sufficiency that exists there. I don't really have a question, but I guess I'd just like to thank you for coming out. I think I'd been mainly aware of the Boys and Girls Club as a place where kids went to engage in activities, but hadn't really been aware of the sort of purposeful programming that you described, and that's really really good background to get. And I especially appreciate, Yana, your comments about how that affected you, and that gives really good insight into uh, how that can affect kids, so thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us uh, the stories and, and, and the work that you're doing to support our students. So I um, really am curious about the conversation at the Boys and Girls Club um, going forward on the family engagement piece. Um, would you would you mind sharing a little more with us as far as um, what your next step would be and 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 where do you see our partnership between the school district and and the Boys and Girls Club specifically regarding the family engagement? I mean, to talk about that. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I, you know, I think I think a lot of our conversation has revolved um, around particularly those families that are transitioning from elementary to middle school and making sure that there is an awareness of the resources that exist. Uh, you know, we also know that family engagement is very difficult. There are a lot of things um, that, you know, families are trying to juggle. And, you know, there are times when, um, you know, if we're doing a family night at the club, um, that we may be able to see a group of families that, you know, the school may not be seeing or vice versa. And so I think, you know, really what we're looking at is how can we be a little bit more deliberate uh, in working together on whether if, if we have something that we're doing, uh, you know, handing out backpacks for back to school and we know it's going to be, you know, a high population of parents, it would be a great opportunity from someone from the school to join us to either provide information, answer questions, make connections that they may not be able to do. And likewise, um, through some of the family efforts at the school, if there are things that, uh, you know, families or, or connections that we're not able to make, um, you know, we can take advantage of some of the existing resources. So I think really what we're looking to do is just try to be a little bit more deliberate in some of the existing resources and how we connect those to make sure that, that our communication with families um, is, is a little bit more robust. Is that a fair assessment? Mm -hmm. yeah. Ryan and um, Ted December, who is the education specialist with King County Housing Authority, um, we just met earlier this week and we were having this very conversation about what are our next steps and um, with that particular population. And I'm sure as you know, family and community engagement is something that we're talking about in a lot of different areas and with regarding a lot of different communities. So um, it's, I think it's a next step for us to really come up with a robust plan overall. say it in a way without, um, I don't want to offend anybody who's not here, but um, it seems like you're, you're doing a lot of what I see, um, like where I sit, families do, you know, I sit down every night and check my kids, you know, like this, not now, it was just in there, but, you know, um, and make sure I have some supplies and coach them on how to talk to the teacher and advocate and that stuff, and so I'm guessing you need to do that for some places where, for whatever reason, families can't see that, so. Thank you for um, stepping in and, and providing that. As we continue to talk about our community partners, um, and I found the document, it got uploaded to, oh. did you find it? Um, anyway, we'll be talking about, or I can talk with you about the number of organizations that are providing one-on-one -on -one mentoring and what our plans are next year to bring that all together under one umbrella. So, um, boys and uh, Boys and Girls Club of Bellevue is one of five organizations that are providing one-to-one -one mentoring for our kids in middle school and high school.
I want to thank you for what you do as well. Um, I have a history of involvement, of my kids' involvement in the Boys and Girls Club in the elementary and middle school programs, and I found it to be a, a very engaging and um, useful experience for them beyond some of the just um, the homework time. I mean, the homework time was helpful. It's better when they have more homework done when I pick them up. But um, I really appreciated the level of integration and respect and the values that they taught the kids. And I, like Steve, didn't have as much exposure to some of your formal programs. So I appreciated the, um, the descriptions of those. I have two questions for you, and, and they are basically, is there anything, I, you're already working with Judy, so I assume it's kind of covered, but is there anything that we can do to better support your work? And then the second is, do you feel like um, you have what you need to collaborate with the other folks on site who are doing similar work to you, like Jubilee Reach is another uh, group that, that's providing similar types of structured support to, to students even during the school day. So um, yeah, what can we do and do you have what you need to, to collaborate with the other partners? Great questions. Uh, you know, I, I think we've talked a lot about collaboration and to Judy's point, I mean, I think that's something that we continue to work through. I mean, we certainly, um, you know, we certainly don't have any intention of trying to work in a vacuum on this. Um, uh, we know there are kids who spend time with us and spend time with, you know, Jubilee or other organizations, and so we have, you know, collaborated, but I certainly think there are obvious opportunities to be a little bit more mindful about how we do that. And so as we, you know, as we move forward with that conversation, I think that's really helpful. Um, you know, I, I think the other place, it's always kind of a little bit of a sticky wicket, although we're, we're working our way through it, is kind of some of the data and tracking on how this, wor you know, how this works and the understanding that there are, you know, there are some, um, you know, some ways in which we can share results of our program and some um, data points that, that we cannot share because of, you know, federal privacy laws. I think that that's something that we continue to try to negotiate and perfect. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we're quite there yet, but I certainly think that we're, you know, we're mindful of it and continue to work towards that. Um, so I don't know that I have a specific ask on either, but I think those are probably um, two of the places where we see opportunity to be a little bit better. Is that a fair? Yes, absolutely. Fair assessment. And and I would say that that data piece is a common theme um, when we meet with the um, the cohort that has this Gates grant. It's a five-year grant, and we meet quarterly at the Gates Foundation. There are three housing development. Um, three housing no, and five school districts. Five school districts and three housing development. Um, authority, there are three housing authorities, and so we get to learn from each other what's working, what isn't working, um, different approaches, family and community engagement has been a big theme, but data is the is the one piece that's kind of holding everybody back, so um, I guess it's comforting to know we're not alone, but we're all trying to figure out the best way to, to make that work, st um, respecting families' privacy but still um, get the data that people need to do, to do the work. So I'd like to give a shout out to Naomi and Kevin, who um, Kevin O'Neill and Naomi Calvo, who have worked on this a lot to try and make things work for all of these partnerships and will continue to do so, so. Great. Well, thank you very, very much for coming out tonight and thank you again for sharing your story. Liana? Yana. Yana. Yana, okay. Thank you so much for sharing that and taking time to be here and preparing it. All right, good luck with your college journey. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. All right, that brings us to um, our highly capable program review, and then we'll go ahead and have a break after that. Does that work for everyone? Oh, and just a side note to the board as everyone comes up to set up um, the attachment that was with the Boys and Girls Club is actually the one that was supposed to be with that eight whatever item that we punted to another meeting, the, um, the community partners. So we'll put that back in, but yeah. Yep. All right, welcome. So we thought um, we would just focus more on the program updates as they um, also include 
our racial equity and inclusion focus. Um, and I'll probably add a few things. But um, I wanted to share with you um, that we have 167 students currently being served in their home school. And so previously when students wanted to exit the full-time program, they basically withdrew from services and they um, were no longer afforded that opportunity. And so now we're working with schools um, where these students are attending and um, creating a plan. Um, the elementary teachers work together to create plans. For secondary, we do a little bit more of providing them a document that kind of talks about what these strengths mean and, and how to better meet their needs in their home school. And then we spend time um, in the schools providing professional development. We um, invite the teachers to the district-wide professional development, but doing as much support as we can so that students that want to stay in their home school environment are able to do that. Um, so that's something that we're excited about. We have 108 high school students, as you probably saw, and the rest are at elementary, but I um, expect to continue to, um, to see that grow. And um, as long as we're on that bullet, I'll talk a little bit about one that you would see later, which is the um, domain-specific services. So we really want to start next year for first graders, identifying them if they just have one strength area um, so that they can also be served in their home school in that area rather than telling them you're not identified for any type of services. Those students need services as well. And then um, the nice thing about those services is that we tell teachers, we don't care if a child is identified for our program or not. If the child um, has the ability to participate with the other students, they should be included in whatever you're doing to meet the needs of those students so that all of our students are getting that same pedagogy and um, higher level learning experience. So um, as you probably have heard yourselves, um, and I've heard a great deal over the last two and a half years, um, is about the gifted label for our program and for our students. Every year when I do focus groups with the students, I don't believe there's ever been one focus group where the students didn't talk about not really appreciating being called gifted. And um, I agree with them. So we're in the middle of a naming challenge where we have asked parents, teachers, staff to send us suggestions um, for names for our program. And, um, you know, they're all over the board. So far we have over 700 responses. So it's um, very interesting to read the responses. Um, some are angry, some are very happy. And um, so we'll, we'll look at all of that information. Um, some of our own program teachers said, why do we need a label at all? And, um, and our thought really is, if you're a third grade student at Cherry Crest, you're just a Cherry Crest third grader, right? You don't really have to have a label. I think that more for administrative purposes, we want to delineate our program. So maybe I use it more in central office, but we don't really need to talk about our program name very much at school and, and make those um, children feel separated or different. Um, as far as curriculum being written, we're um, doing the finishing touches really on our GMSP curriculum, and so that's something that's really been in the work over the last several years, and then um, beginning to get our high school curriculum written. And last spring we heard from University of Washington um, because we had the Robinson Center professors coming and teaching, and they had um, decided they were going to leave UW, and they didn't really have anybody to replace them. And um, we knew that with the strength of some of our teachers that we could write programs or write courses for our senior level students. And um, so those two courses have been written. And what's really nice about the college level English is that it will be available for all of our gifted students across the district who have finished their AP um, requirements by the end of their junior year. So that's what we're working on curriculum wise. Um, and then we started testing for secondary and private schools in December this year. We usually have done that in January, February, and then they don't get their results until springtime. Um, it was impeding our private school parents because the school was asking them to make their deposit for the upcoming year, which meant that most of those students then, if they were identified for services, were deferring and not coming into the district for a year. Um, but by getting them their results earlier, they've been able um, to make decisions earlier on and come into Bellevue next year rather than staying in the private school setting. Um, and as well, of course, our schools can start working on their master schedules a little bit earlier. Um, and of course, you are aware of the challenge of our um, racial demographics. 
And I shared with you last year how we're working with the Title I schools, Phantom Lake and Woodridge, um, increasing communication with those families as well as providing um, applications with information about the program to the teachers. So at conferences with parents, teachers can slide that information and application and um, encourage families to apply for gifted testing because we know it's really about who applies and having kind of a referral based system where parents or teachers refer. We don't receive referrals for all races of students or it's unbalanced the number that we receive. So trying to encourage that through those schools. Um, as well, we're planning on a universal pilot of second grade students. So eventually we'd like to test all second grade students in the district. Um, but next year we'll work with just Ardmore, Woodridge, and Clyde Hill and um, test the second graders at their school and see how, how that works out so that we can better plan to roll it out to all of the elementary schools. Um, but moving away from our kindergarten testing and looking at K-1 students really just through the, the data and the observations and the information we receive from teachers and parents about those students. So moving that, the funding that we spend on that standardized test, which is really not a fair assessment for kindergarten students. As we know, they come in at varying levels. And so students who have had more preparation at home come in and do better on that assessment than students who have not. So it's better for us to be looking kind of at those students all through K-1 and providing um, for them any time. And so I've you know, told the principals that I've worked with thus far, we don't care if it's the middle of kindergarten. If a teacher wants to contact us, we will look at their data, we'll come out. They can join um, the program at any time. And then um, those students, we would probably ask to take the cognitive assessment when they, if they want to go to the full-time program during second grade, but if they want to stay in their home school, they would receive those services um, all the way through 12th grade. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that for the students um, in K-1, mm -hmm. that all of them would receive services in their schools and that you wouldn't test into the formal full-time program until second grade period? Right, and currently That's that correct. they test, but they receive services in their home school now. So they don't go to a program. We do a, a differentiated plan for each K-1 identified student in their homeschool career. But currently, if they do qualify for that, are they automatically put into the second uh -huh. grade program? They roll right up. But now too. we're changing that so that we would, all students would still have to test at second grade. Is that correct? Right, correct. Thank you. And so that's really kind of all I have for updates. I don't know if you had questions based on um, the information that was sent or if there was something else you wanted me to share. I think we're up to questions. I've got a list of like 20. So where's, where's everybody else at? Who wants to start? All right, you're up. Um, I thought your comment on slide 14, I don't know if you addressed this verbally or if you did, I'd love to have you go into elaborate more on it. But your comment is you provide that providing opportunities to receive gifted services in their home school increases participation of students who have typically been underserved. I thought that was a really interesting comment. And especially when you consider our district's focus on equity can you elaborate a little bit on what you see as the relationship between the, the equity goal and this idea of serving gifted kids in their home schools? I think that there are some students that elect. Do you want her to answer? After oh, sorry, I forgot question. that we've been That's doing okay. questions. That's okay, can do that. Um, I like to stay with them. Okay. <laughs> One. Just to answer them. Since we have enough time left, why don't we do that? But could I ask you guys to moderate your um, comments so that you don't take seven minutes to answer Steve's question and then there's not time left for everybody. So just like maybe two minutes a question. <laughs> Thanks. I, I guess I think about who, um, who applies to be served and it's a parent decision. And so many parents don't choose to even apply for us to investigate whether or not their child needs services. So we know we have students and we have teachers that tell us all the time, I have students whose needs I'm having a really difficult time meeting. Um, so they're sitting in those classrooms but not formally identified as in need of anything. And so being able to you know, say to parents, your child really you know, is in need of higher level and getting it early on, that's why we're thinking about second grade so that they, um, so that they start early on and then we can pave the way for success in the future. Okay. That's really interesting. I, I would ask you more about that and what you saw as the, as the path forward and 
how you saw that developing going forward. But I guess my first question is, in the same vein, uh, does the domain-specific service, uh, do you think that is a thing that will encourage us uh, delivering more services in all buildings? Is, is that a key to? Yes, yeah. I do. And, I, and I'd, I'd like um, to hear more about that. I, had, I can imagine what the complications are with that, and I'm just wondering. How you when we look at student data, we often will have a child with a spike in one area. And um, because we know that when they move to a full-time program, they're working at you know one, two, maybe even three grade levels above. And so to put them in a situation where they're, the demands on them in every subject area are at that level, but they maybe only have a math strength, um, we feel like that's putting them in a situation that's setting them up for failure. But now we can serve that student that really has that math domain in their home school. And so I think we'll see that we're identifying more students that way. So the number will increase, um, but then we'll also be building capacity, capacity with teachers to really meet the needs of those students. And I think we'll have more students that are eligible to go to the center even choose to stay in their home school because of what they see. That's really exciting piece of this. I hope so, too. Yeah. <laughs> Charles? Well, when I opened your presentation and I saw the two years, I sat there and totally thought, I wish I had this about seven years ago. Because I was serving like 14 kids in an asylum in the sixth grade right now. And I'm so pleased and I'm so grateful for kids going forward. But I'm also sad for my own situation because this would have, this is exactly what I wanted to have happen. So I, I, I am grateful. Um, and um, what was the other one? Oh, um, I was wondering, you know, how do you catch kids who had a bad day in second grade or had a cold or were sick or just didn't show up or moved to the district later? Um, how do you, I know, is, how are you going to plan to catch those kids? That's something that we're, we're working on right but now. And doing it through schools right now. But right, yeah. and so, and that came up in our conversation with those schools. What are we going to do about those students right. that move in late? And so we'll have to try to develop a system for identifying them. With K-1, we often have kids that move in, you know, during kindergarten that if they move in really close to the testing window, we test them. If they move in later, we pick them up in the fall. So we always have a plan to test new kids the next year. So it's something that we'll have to, to develop as far as that goes as well, just so that we can kind of keep a tab on every child. But anyway, anyway I, I think it's a real Step in the right direction. Well, thank yeah, you. On many fronts. Thanks. Yeah. Milan? So, thank you, Laura. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have chatted with you on Sci-Li whenever, <laughs> whenever we ran into each other. And I, I guess my, my question is, um, with the data provided <laughs> in the presentations regarding the, uh, the academic uh, performance of our students who are in the uh, program, Excellence. Um, so I, I guess my question to you is regarding um, their, I guess their meter of happiness, um, their meters of how do they feel that they are being served? Do they, uh, are they happy uh, where they are? Um, and, and, and I guess part of that question is reflected through probably that challenge being sent out there regarding the name. Um, <laughs> But we know it's, it's really the surface of the thing. It's, it's really more important to me um, that our students feel belong, that they are in the right place, um, that serve their needs. Um, and so could you speak to us a little bit about, about that aspect of, of service to our students in the gifted program? Yes. Um, I know especially probably when I go to the high school, I will hear from some students about their friends who they're a little bit worried about. And um, we've spent some time at the high school actually doing what we call some stress sessions um, during social studies, like once a month, having one of the counselors go in and um, I bought them some resources to work with the students. And they were amazed, they actually didn't think it would work and they were amazed when they went in that the students really did open up and speak about things. So that's been helpful. Um, I think that the difficulty comes sometimes with what the student wants and what the parents want. And so sometimes it's a little harder for the student to navigate their own path. Um, and you know, although we have several that are navigating back to their home school, as you can see, which is good. So making that decision, um, but some who I think feel a little bit pressure to stay 
in the program. And then, um, you know, a gifted characteristic is putting pressure upon yourself as well. And so many of our students are really hard on themselves, which, you know, can kind of create some unhappy. But those are things that we really try to work on. Um, and I meet with the teachers very often throughout the school year. And oftentimes the focus of our conversation is more on the social emotional needs of the students and sharing practices across schools and grade levels um, to, to discuss and share with the students and try to help them. So could I just a really quick follow up is that, so it sounds like we have something to support our students. I wonder as we go forward, if we could have maybe conversation with parents so there's more awareness in the area of making sure that our students' social emotional um, needs are being met right. through family. Right, Thank yes, you. and I know the teachers will initiate individual meetings, and I was offered a support, but, um, but you know, often we're not successful in changing the, the path, so, <laughs> but we try if we think it's, it's damaging to the students, so. Well, it's nice to have things like that part of our programmatic culture so that it doesn't become a hit or miss. It becomes something that's a culture that we perpetuate through our students, our teachers, and our connections to our families, and what's, what's expected becomes a different a different thing. So I, I think I'm excited about the questions that Neelan asked. And I have had Dr. Cash come before and speak with the parents as well. And um, he talks a lot about those kind of issues. And you know, that then it depends on which parents actually come to the presentation, but it's at least nice to have an expert in the field to come and share that information and talk with them about the pressures on their children. Yeah. Um, so I am excited about a lot of the changes in the program. Um, I really like the, the, I mean, we knew, it's been, I think, seven years since we did the report on, on gifted. Mm -hmm. And we finally are, we, we've got the pieces in place to do some single um, silo s subject support in, in different spaces when people have that in, in their local schools. So that's fantastic. Um, it's exciting. Uh, I'm, I love the inclusion stuff. I am wondering about, how to actively do more to identify the kids early so that when they hit second grade, they got some of those services. Kids who have potential, but maybe they wouldn't appear to be in that space. How did they get the services? You know, a lot of the kids who end up testing into our gifted program, they do all sorts of things. Like they go and develop their math capacity through different lessons and skills outside of classes. And, um, you know, and that's just part of, of what people do, but this, I wonder how we give opportunities like that to some of our underrepresented community members who have the um, inclinations in certain areas. So I hope that we'll keep, I hope that we're not done, I guess is my point in that space. Um, and I, I guess the question that I'm gonna ask, um, I do think that we should think about the not using the name. I think there's a psychology in both directions and I kind of wonder if we do due diligence to explore it. We worry about the tension that's created in segregating, but there's also the tension that's created by kids who come from a different neighborhood into a school where they're not part of the neighborhood. Their parents aren't part of the social fabric, they're not part of that, and here they are. And to say, you're just a third grader at Cherry Crest. Well, no, maybe I was a third grader at Ardmore and now I'm a third grader at Cherry, you know, a second grader at Ardmore, and now I'm a third grader at Cherry Crest. Yeah. My community was there. I don't, like, I'm here for a reason. So I think it's important that we are tuned into both sides of the psychology there. My question for you about the data that you presented is, I noticed that we have about a quarter of our kids in the category of high performing, low growth mm -hmm. in almost all the data. That's a pretty heavy percentage of kids who are in high, performing to have low growth. What are we doing there? Well, I asked Naomi actually if she would, and she was supposed to be meeting with them today and getting back to me about, um, you know, why is it that we're not seeing growth? I actually went to a middle school class and observed while the students were taking STAR exams and they told me we get the same questions every time we take the test. And Naomi said, that's not supposed to happen. They're not supposed to see those questions again. Which then I said, well, that indicates to me that they have kind of reached the top of the test. Yeah. So the test is no longer measuring growth for our students um, because we can see the percentages that they're receiving on these assessments. But, but 
but we're not able to measure the growth, I think, I because. Understand. Right. To show growth. To show growth. So, so a full so quarter of those kids have topped out the instrument? I'm not sure, but I can tell you, standing in that classroom, <laughs> the majority of the students tell me, oh, yes, this always happens. We always get the same test question. So it's something that she um, was going to address. It would be great to with hear the, more as you guys learn more about because that. I, be and I know that that's a national trend where they talk about students, you know, topping out the test and then, then it just can't measure growth because if you're scoring at the 99th percentile every time, you know, how does that really show that you're, you're growing? So. Um, All right. Um, so we have just a couple minutes. I want to make sure, are there any additional parts of uh, data requests that anyone has for these guys? Mm -hmm. is you have a chart of all the colleges that the, uh, the kids who did go to, and I would like to compare that somehow in a way that would allow it to be compared to something like Newport. I've heard that you can get that list um, through the Navians program, oh, okay. um, yeah. because I thought that myself too. I'd like to, you know, and then I don't really know that matriculation data for our students who are attending their home school. Well, we'd also, yeah, we'd have to sort of, I want to say, make it comparable because there's a different number of kids and all that. But Right. Yeah, and, and how the kids do when they're, when they're in the So it sounds like what you're asking for is a, a comparative report on college matriculation or college acceptance. Is there, um, is there a report coming up at some point where such a cross high school report would be appropriate so we're not asking for an additional thing? I don't think there's an urgency to this one. I thought we had it. I thought we had it when uh, Jeff Brown Brown came here. out and, and did the presentation uh, a month or so ago. Okay. It was more comprehensive, yeah. but uh, but she did give us that. Why report. don't you take a look, and if it's missing, then ask Sharon, and you guys can give us some kind of update. I can certainly at some work point. with Deb to get that information as well. Okay. And one thing that will be hard is that we don't have. This is our first year we've identified students that are going to their home school as gifted in their right. home school. So, so we won't have very sense. many seniors, oh, okay. um, right. but it. Um, I think it'd be nice to just compare, though, our traditional students and our gifted and see if they're having like results. Okay. Any other questions for these guys? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of interest in this, developing this piece of the homeschool possibility for our students. And, you know, I think whatever we might know about the other resource the support pieces that are supporting this program, whether it's professional development, whether it's use of the bill, what, I don't even want to presume that I know what it is, but it would be good to it would be good to see that as 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 pointed out uh, in the because I think you there's 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 support for this concept and what it where it might what it might lead to. But then we should know what it takes to make it happen besides just the the plan. Yeah. Right, and we've talked a little bit about that, and even a little bit about personnel as we develop that and how do we support. Right, and I don't mean to say it as a negative at all. I really just am saying what it, this is really important, an right. important issue. This is about professional development of our, of our, of our teaching staff mm -hmm. to be able to address uh, a broader array of students and what does that take? We ought to own that, what right. it takes. Yeah. Right, and the nice thing is by rolling it up one year at a time, then our focus will be you know, really second grade one year and then third grade the next and yeah. fourth grade so that we can really work with all those teachers. Um, but also having maybe a support person that can go in to the schools and work with them, do some coaching, some planning, some co-teaching and those kind of things is, those are the things that are in my head that aren't totally mapped out yet, but. Yeah. <laughs> so I have one thing I would like additional data on when it's available, no, no rush for this at all. Um, as you try this, embark on this program where you're going to do the in-house curriculum for the senior uh, LASS courses, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that our gifted kids haven't had is a really good chance to go and experience college because the, um, the Running Start program doesn't necessarily address their needs. Um, and so the, having the UW course available to them instead of the community college courses available to them for certain things was a, a nice um, opportunity. So taking that away um, and putting them back in a high school classroom with a high school class, even though the curriculum is college, does take some pieces away. So I'm wondering um, how we'll look at the other pieces of that long term, like whether it's, you know, 
I guess the UW class was done such that each class only met twice a week. They had to manage a schedule. And we're still doing things. it that way. Yeah. They never went to the UW. Yeah. They, did, they met at Interlake. Yep. And that is still the way that we are, we've organized the class. It's just taught by Doug Calvert and Ryan Rolfs. But they're still doing it with the college way Mindset. where right where it's right. two days a week and that kind of thing and they've used some of the open stacks um, college materials and looked at some you know college syllabi and such to to write the courses um, and then mr. Calvert in English is spending a lot of time really getting the students prepared for college as well all right well I'd love to hear how that's going yeah. so thank you very much for the reports and it sounds like we have one piece of data then and all good yep. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Great. Okay. All right, that takes us to a break. We have 10 minute breaks. Good. Up for our mid year progress check here. So if we could have Eva and Elizabeth come forward with guests. All right. We just 25. She is. Melissa left early. She has a sick child oh. that texted her while she was here at the meeting. So, uh, Mr. Jeff. And I do have hard copies of the report if any of them would rather have that than uh, what was online because we're not projecting anything. That's okay. It's all here. And you can also have a printout if you like. This, uh, this really, I, I thought, would just be a discussion. You, you've, you've seen the report. I know you've been very busy with other things. Um, we have, uh, Melissa's not here, so I can respond to um, finance and operations to a point, as can Jeff, because he's worked closely there. Okay. Um, and we thought we'd just open it for, uh, for questions and comments that you might have. Um, you know, I listed, I only selected six, well, seven challenges. Obviously, in a school district, there are lots of challenges, but these are the ones that, that uh, we felt are, are, are really some of the bigger pieces for us to be thinking about. So with that, I'll open it up for questions, comments. Board, um, how would you like to handle this discussion? We can do give everyone a question and then let the staff respond to the five questions and then go around again if we have time. We can do one by one or we can just, uh, and if you don't have specific questions, you wanna talk about um, some general space, we can do that as well. So where are people at? What would you like to do? I will confess to being unprepared on this topic. So with all the other stuff that's been going on, I have not given this any kind of review. I've given it a cursory glance. Maybe it, the best thing that we can do is give the next five minutes to just have us look it over in so real time, and then we can still get these guys to answer questions for 20 minutes, so. I have five questions at various levels of specificity. Okay. It's on the, you know, overarching intent. Uh, like, you know, yes. Okay, um, to make sure that everybody gets a question out there, uh, if you, why don't we, is it, is it okay if folks, t if we take five minutes here on this? Because I think we'll have a more productive discussion if we have more people inputting. Or we could consider kind of breaking from our direction we've been going lately, which is to try to have less commentary from staff and instead have maybe more introductory commentary would be another approach. What do you mean introductory commentary? Well, we've been asking for more time for Q and A and less time for actually walking through something. Oh, you want maybe, them to walk us up? Maybe we could have a little bit more time this time to have staff walk All right. us through it. Can we get a five-minute walkthrough of the data? So just highlights and and kind of get us ac acquainted. That would be helpful. Well, the first. So I I will just say the the first uh, four pages are. We took a look at what we saw as some of the big pieces of our work over the, over the last few years. And we broke it into this area of student success and professional development, uh, the leadership positions that we've added, and some of that is just by rearranging staff, looking at process around employee relations and uh, our work with facilities. Um, I, so that was really intended. I think those are just, uh, there's not any data associated with those. Those are just sort of the high level. This is where we've invested time. This is where we've invested effort. And obviously, there are dollars that have gone in to support those areas. Um, 
not meant to be a laundry list, and that wasn't the intent of this. This was really more of, uh, of the work that we saw is really the bigger pieces. Uh, Melissa did a similar piece as we looked at finance and operations, dividing it into to the key areas. So again, it's, it's really, these are the big pieces. Keep it in mind that, as you well know, in the day-to-day -day operation of an organization <coughs> our size, there's just an awful lot of work that's going on, but trying to focus it back to these are really the key points. The one area that I might ask uh, uh, Elizabeth just to make some comments on is um, we did some restructuring in the communication department in 2014, and I, I asked her to put together, uh, and I'll have her just highlight what, Elizabeth, what you think would be the big pieces, but I think oftentimes as we look at communication, we're not, all, we're not aware of everything that the communication department has been about and what they've been trying to do. And so I, um, and also she's identified some key strategic pieces moving forward. So you wanna just do two or three highlights that you'd, you'd like to call um, out? Sure, so I mean basically what we've been trying to do over the last several years is to increase our capacity and also develop channels where our community wants the information, in other words, areas where they, they're present as opposed to just assuming that what we've been doing in the past is the best practice. Um, and so over the last several years, we did restructure the department We've increased our social media presence and engagement significantly, and we've also developed an internal um, staff newsletter, which we never, we, had, which we haven't had for several years, um, as well as a stronger external communication piece. Um, and so right now we're at the point where the channels are actually quite strong, um, and the response and the engagement is really significant. And so over the next few years, what we would like to do is basically develop a strategic communication calendar for the district. Um, focus on expanding social media use for the schools, which right now they're very limited in their use. Um, and then just basically from there work on media relations, revitalizing our brand as a district, um, and then continuing to, to strengthen that engagement. Um, and so what I provided here was some data just so that you can see some of the growth we've had around social media um, and the channels and the coverage. I can tell you that overview so before we did the restructure we published one to two publications um, a month we managed about 10 to 13 media contacts and we did website every you know everyday updates and special projects right now on a monthly basis we're publishing seven to eight publications including the internal and external communications we're pushing out 10 to 15 Facebook and Twitter posts a month um, we're managing 15 to 30 media contacts which is inquiries and outreach. And we're still updating the website every day and then doing special projects, which is a significant increase in our overall communication with the community. I think one of the, the big pieces that I will just comment on with this also is in, in uh, the work of having our communication specialists in their role. Yeah. I, don't, I didn't give them the, the right title. The communication managers. The communication managers, they're assigned to schools. So they're assigned to a set of schools. And so they're meeting specifically with the principals. They start the, they start the school year, and they're the go-to folks. So if a principal says, I need to get this information out, or I want to call, highlight that they have, a, they know who that they go to, and there is a, a relationship that's established with them. And we're seeing that grow in terms of response from our schools. And like this year, too, like for example, Christina had been working with Tom when he was over at Sammamish, and so now that he's at the district office and they're doing work around the SIS, he actually made a request to have Christina continue working with him because they had already established a relationship and a rapport, which is, again, a positive of having them do that. And then the last section is uh, just our update. The data you have seen, obviously, it'll be updated again at the end of the year, but what we did uh, identify, and I'll let Eva speak to this, is really around uh, some of the key strategies specifically. And do you want to do an overview of this, Eva? Sure. Um, the three key strategies that you see under academic success are um, equity, inclusion, and MTSS. And given our data and the groups, that, the subgroups that we found that are, um, as a trend, um, performing at a lower rate than the rest of our population. Um, we realized that there were some work that we needed to do around racial equity, around inclusion for our um, 
students with IEPs and our um, ELL students. And then the MTSS process is just a process of looking at um, a universal screening tool, looking at that data, determining which kids need something different. So it actually, in the MTSS model, could be a, a gifted student. It could be a domain-specific student like Laura just described. But we're not that far along. What we're looking at are kids who um, are not on a trajectory to meet proficiency um, based on you know, standards in um, our state testing standards. And so, um, so the MTSS process is the universal screen, looking at student data, Decide, deciding who's not on trajectory, and then developing um, interventions for those students and approaches that you can use either within the classroom in small group or if it's a student who's really an outlier in terms of um, level of concern, then it could be in a one-to-one -one or in a special ed setting. So looking at what does that individual student need, what do groups of students need, and then providing it and coming back every four to six weeks to determine whether or not the interventions are working to the level that they need to be and whether or not they're being implemented with fidelity. That's, in, in essence, the MTSS process. And it sounds like something you would think we'd been do, you know, it sounds like that, that just makes sense, and we should have probably been doing that all along. And we have been to some level, but we don't always have the right tools and the right measurement tools at the right interventions. Um, so that process we have solidified and that we are implementing that really well in the elementary level. Um, somewhat well in the middle school level and really this year is the first year that I think at the high school now we really have that at the beginning stages but it's it's happening we have MTSS teams and systems in place so those were three of the key strategies that we chose for um, that are more generalized that apply to any um, content area and then for the college and career ready strategies, you're going to see that they're the same um, key strategies, equity, inclusion, and MTSS. But in addition to those, we've done some specific things. Um, I just want to speak a minute to the, to the racial equity component. The racial equity component for us means um, looking at um, our own practices and the culture within our school and how that might contribute to some disparities for our different racial groups. And so we're working on culturally responsive teaching and learning practices and the brain and trying to understand that better. But in addition to that, um, what kind of education are we giving all kids so that kids in any, um, any racial group have just a better um, cultural awareness and understanding um, and about race. So we're looking at our curriculum and how does our curriculum inform students and how is it um, showing students who may be in marginalized groups but that um, not showing victimized a, any racial group but who are the leaders in those groups and how is that depicted through our curriculum? How are the authors of books that we're presenting kids with, how is, how is that a diverse group? So we're looking at two areas. How are we teaching kids and um, who may have different cultural backgrounds or um, that we need to understand better our own pedagogy and what we're bringing as teachers and educators and also what is the education that we're giving kids. Great. So I think I want to do a, just a check in with the board here where we've um, got about 12 and a half, 13 minutes left here and it seems like we do have folks with questions. I know I have some now, probably others do. Should we do a, a pause here and, and do a round of questions? Um, I Folks be comfortable with that? Yeah, I, yeah, and I'm just happy to just keep listening to them go through the materials. I don't, I don't really have a specific question at this point. I'm in the same place. I don't, I'd be happy to just listen, but if the board has questions, then that's fine too. Yeah. I have one, Milan, and Carolyn has six, <laughs> Milan. Well, I, I do have questions, but I, I think if I could uh, ask Eva to finish up uh, the positive productive life, please. Oh, sure. Uh, to finish up the instructional initiative uh, part, then we can go ahead and move into the, our second. Does that work for everyone? I like that suggestion. Carolyn, that works? Yeah. All right, finish that, and then we'll dive in with a few questions. Okay, so the positive and productive life, if you remember that that's an area that the state doesn't measure, we don't have measures. And so when we started that, we really had to unpack, what do we mean? We kind of all, all knew, ooh, there's this other part that we're missing. We're so focused on the academic, but there's the other part of the child that we want to develop that we don't really, 
we, we weren't really sure how to define that. So we started, remember, with the social emotional learning, so we have that component. But then we realized when we're teaching kids how to regulate their own emotions and how to be aware of their emotions and um, be healthy in that way, um, we might be actually setting them off by some of our practices that we're using in the classroom that could be humiliating or, you know, that aren't best pra practices. And so that's where we introduced this um, training on uh, proactive classroom management strategies and moving away from punitive or practices that um, don't help kids actually have a healthy esteem. <laughs> and, and what we've learned through studying more about the brain is that when you do put kids in situations like that, that it actually hijacks their brain and they can't really think. And so it is impacting them academically as well. So there was that component, the social emotional learning, how do I take care of myself? How does my teacher know how to use best practices in terms of classroom management? And then the school-wide PBS is then when I go to the lunchroom or out to recess or I'm in the hallways, what are the systems in place? Or when I do make a mistake and I break a rule, how does the school respond? What, what are the discipline practices? And that's the school-wide PBIS where we're changing that, um, the climate and culture school-wide. So in a nutshell, those are the three areas. And then finally, we had the commitment to the community. Remember that we want all of our kids to be global citizens and to understand their role. What is a community? What's my role? And how do I get actively involved to better my community no matter where I live or um, and I understand that from a local and a global perspective. And so you already heard that commitment to the community um, from Patty Shelton, I believe. And so um, in a nutshell, we have a lot of work that's gone on there, and that's very exciting, and we're nowhere near done, but that is an area that um, where a tremendous amount of work has been done. All right. <coughs> so why don't we give Carolyn the first question, but why don't we do our regular practice that we had been doing for a bit where each person kind of states a question, and then they can tackle them grouped or ungrouped or whatever, and if we have time, we'll get a few more questions. So I have a bunch of questions and a request. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the one, the, the report was about everything, right? Mm -hmm. So there were a few things that are kind of specific that it jogged in my mind, so I'm gonna hold those. And the one thing that I've been just thinking <coughs> about looking at this huge overview is, um, so we have 15 to 20% of kids that don't meet standards as we're measuring them. Um, and we have a 95% Pfizer graduation rate. So does that, what does that mean? Does that mean that 20, 15 to 20% of kids gradually, um, okay, so my, my fear is that then some point in high school they're not meeting the standards, but yet they are graduating. <coughs> so are they just working those last couple of years in high school on meeting those standards and not like actually getting to a 12th grade teacher? Okay, that's fine. Yeah. All right. So I have. <laughs> I have one question for uh, communications and one question for instructional initiative. So the question for communications, at, 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 I, I, if I recall correctly, um, whether last year or the year before, we had a conversation regarding finding a way that uh, that we could create a community engagement. Uh, uh, both way, in two ways. Uh, whereas that, where when I look at social media, my thinking is is that to almost uh, similar to our website is 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 a single way. It's it's one way that we 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 put out the informations and. Um, well, community could then have the option of calling us to, to, to clarify information. If that's the case, please do let me know. Um, and so that the, the two ways, uh, community engagement, I want to know more about that. Um, and then in regard to um, instructional uh, initiatives, I, um, I am very appreciative of the deep thinking uh, around um, educating our kids um, uh, with the with the three areas. I I wonder how do we go forward from here? And and I hear it repeatedly, but I I wanted to know if we put even more thinking into into the 
the issues that we have identified that for the past four years, our growth is, is kind of flat. Um, and um, with, with all the things that we put in place, where do we go from here um, at this point? Okay, and I'll add a question. Um, maybe it's two, but they're, they're really tied together. When I look at the challenges, I am kind of blown away that there's nothing in here about the achievement gap. Um, it's it's uh, one of the things that I feel most mystified about, about where we're making progress. So if I were gonna highlight, I would expect that to be in here. And when I think of our three um, priorities of inclusion, racial equity, and um, a culture of service, I see a couple nods to culture of service, um, primarily in the, the engaging families space. Um, which could also be a touch on racial equity uh, spaces. And then I see a very specific um, piece about inclusion, but I don't really see the piece in racial equity and I don't wanna read too much into that, but I'm sort of thinking, why isn't that showing up on the, the mega challenges? Does that mean we've got stuff in place? And when I looked at the, um, the part of the report from curriculum and instruction, the, the um, academic initiatives, or instructional initiatives, those, those pieces spoke to me in terms of racial equity that we have a lot of really neat things going on at the high school level, but I didn't see like, you know, high school curriculum changes, new courses, like uh, CTE inclusion. But part of the racial equity issue is that these kids are having issues like from, from day one and it's building. So what's happening that I don't have, I mean, because this is a highlights report, what's going on at the lower levels that, that this doesn't expose us to? So I guess really I'm looking for what's, what's hidden here on that particular issue because I, I assumed I'd see more on that particular one. And Chris or um, Steve, is there anything else you want them to touch on while they go through? All right. You can organize however you like. Okay. So, but I also, so on the community engagements, we, we're still using that process, mm -hmm. but it is specific. So for instance, uh, there was, um, when you think about the uh, high school start time, that was very much in a two-way opportunity. It wasn't just something that we pushed out. Uh, when we were doing work about uh, elementary 18, and we had that, we had an actual committee, and we had meetings at schools, we, it very much was about the community engagement. So, those are falling into where there are sp really specific pieces for that. So we haven't left that, and we actually use that chart to determine which which one of those formats uh, are the, the formats that are going to get us to the objective that we're needing in terms of gathering that information. So that, that's just one piece that I'll let Elizabeth go ahead. Yeah, so specifically in regards to social media and Facebook, so when you think of our website, we publish information, and the information is completely pushed out. There's no opportunity to comment or start out our dialogue. If you look at our Facebook page, there's a couple of things that people can do. They can comment. We allow them to, to rate the district, to write reviews on us. Um, and then the other thing that we're doing is that we're also following like partners and other organizations. And so if, they, if they're doing something that we're co-sponsoring with them, we also like their items so it shows up in our feed. So there is an opportunity, if they choose to be on Facebook, to engage with us on a different level, whereas, you know, on the website we'll post something. They can't really comment on it. They, they can just consume the information if they're there. Um, and Facebook, it does allow you to have more of a dialogue, and that's kind of one of the areas that we're, we're in discussion around schools because it does take people to manage that dialogue. Like my staff is checking Facebook on a daily basis to look at comments, to see the messages that we're getting and to make sure that we're responding. Um, but that's the engagement piece that's different from the website. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Partially. It may not be engagement the way you would want, as like having an in-person dialogue, but it is a way for the community to be able to say, hey, I think this is really great, or I have a question about the decision you made, or, or whatnot. I'm curious, and of course I don't want to um, tiptoes into the operation piece in this, especially I'm not an expert. Um, but the, the, the piece where when we push out information, so, 
Ah, uh, I'm trying to think what information we push out. We push out quite a bit of inf information. So th the most recent one is, is a celebratory one. Uh, um, our students from Odo Middle School have won a regional uh, silent vote and going on to, I believe, it's national. Um, if we could include uh, a piece of, if you're interested in, in following them, this is Odo Middle School website. I mean, it's, it's a little more engaging in that sense rather than just simply, oh, here's the information. Um, I, I, I see it as an encouragement for finding more, learning more, how do you replicate that in your own kids' school, that kind of engagement. All right, so I'm gonna cut off the conversation on this one, there's only a minute left and, and that's not a good practice. We need to make sure we manage like to get to all the questions. I'll skip my question, but can we get Carolyn some attention I before? Just ask a quick question. Um, oh, did I ask? Yeah, no, I already asked a question. Yeah, so I want to get that, I want to give them time to answer it. About the, um, uh, it's happening to me in leadership meetings, I'd like to speak. So do you want to give Carolyn's um, questions? Carolyn, I think your question was, we have a 95% graduation rate. Does that mean that we're graduating kids who aren't meeting standard? And the way that the state um, defines meeting standard, there are some, there are some categories where a, a student could um, be defined as meeting standard, even though they didn't um, score at a level three, for example. So that's, that's one way a student could be still considered meeting standard by the state's um, definition. Also, when they are required to meet standard in, um, in certain of the state exams in order to graduate from high school, but the state does allow some alternative ways to demonstrate that but through taking courses. So it's a messy answer because the answer is they have to have shown proficiency to meet and meet standard. However, how they define that, oh, you could have taken a course and passed that course, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, so if you didn't pass um, the exam. So there are other ways that kids could meet standard without really passing the exam to the level that we would call proficiency. And I, th I think my question was also school. about how, um, like it's, in, it's the biology, it's like a, some yeah. of the early high school courses are the state standard. Right. And so my concern is that then maybe they're also missing. Uh, well, then they develop a plan from there if they didn't meet standard and then they, right, they, right. they take coursework <coughs> to, to demonstrate their meeting standard or they um, retake the exam. And the pass rate at the high school level is much higher than it is at our early level. And so that could mean, that could mean that standards are lower. It could mean well, kids pick it up somewhere along the way, it could mean, you know, but so your answer isn't a straight yes or no that they're meeting standard, but not necessarily to the level that we would have defined earlier in those. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. So if board members have more questions, since we are in a busy frame um, and folks didn't get the questions they wanted, maybe go ahead and pass them on to Tim and then the staff can over the next couple weeks we'll prepare respond, some though. responses and just send them to the whole board and include them as an addendum to the minutes so that it's all um, available for everyone. Is that all right? So just try to get your questions if you have any. And if you have time to, to do a short response on my question, not, not <coughs> verbally, but in, as part of that, that would be awesome. Sure, we can do that. Okay, short, it doesn't have to be huge. Thank you, all right. Thanks very much, everyone. That's a lot of stuff we're working on. And that takes us um, right into our board business. Great overview, a lot of stuff. Um, so I am bringing a policy to the board for consideration um, that we can put up, but it's, it, I'm hoping we won't spend more than five minutes and we can either decide to go ahead or not. But in talking with Tim, uh, our meeting limit of three and a half hours is making it really hard for us and we, um, to get our work done. And I talked to him about the idea of respecting staff time and what's available and board time and, and productivity. And, and the conclusion we came to was we didn't want to add tons of time, but if we, could get, if we could get just half an hour additional to the max time for the board meetings, and we would still stay at the aim of three hours, but for the next couple of months, it looks like we could really use a couple of exceptions to get, take us to a four hour max time for planning the meetings. So my question is whether or not the board would be open to that. Several people have said they were open to it in the first place. 
Um, but I did want to check in on that. I think that um, there is a forcing function with a maximum of three and a half hours that does cause us to ask questions like, should we get this report as written only, which I think has been helpful. If we're just looking at some stuff over the next two months, we already have the mechanism in place to extend. All we have to do is tell the board, hey, we really need four hours for the first meeting in April and the second meeting in May or whatever, and then the board can vote at planning time to extend those to four hours. So I would personally prefer to keep the non-vote limit at three and a half, and then just understand that every once in a while, we will vote to have longer meetings. Okay, to be clear, it really isn't just a, um, an artifact. It is an artifact of the next two months, but it is also something that um, we think that the, the calendar that we have at this point, we're like fighting to put things off it. I do also appreciate the, um, the exercise of, of prioritizing. And there are several things that uh, we're regular, like we already went through the exercise of putting written reports and so forth. So I, I will definitely be asking for the board's permission to look at April and May with longer meetings. But um, I do think it's something worth considering. And I think I've been the biggest proponent of keeping at 3.5 hours. So I find myself surprised to be in this space. But I do think it might be um, worthy because of the mature place we're in with the reporting. Um, we're at a, just a different place in knowing what our business is. We don't seem to be prioritizing things that are worth, not worthwhile. So I'm open to either way, but it is more than a, a short-term artifact. Newlyn, Carolyn, Chris, comment? Well, I, I constantly find myself um, battling for time. And, and yes, I do appreciate the idea of prioritizing um, and with our calendar, I, I think we are really have a great structure as far as making sure we're not missing anything, making sure that we uh, follow through with different programs and, 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 and initiatives in our, in our system. But I, 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 I find myself missing uh, very much that opportunity I had on my very first year being on board, uh, having that dialogue with board. I, I found that there are occasions that having that dialogue with board um, would be valuable for me, uh, partially to really learn what you know, because we cannot possibly know everything. Uh, each of us have certain area of interest and somehow we dive more into it. And, and to be able to learn what you know as my uh, colleague is important beside hearing the report from, from staff. And so I am in the space of needing more time instead of keep fighting myself to keep myself um, off that time period. Okay, we have about one minute left dedicated to this discussion, speaking of time. So Carolyn and Chris, do you have any opinion? And what I would add to the conversation, uh, I, think you should, I think you should consider, do we take the board calendar and we stretch it out farther? It seems to me that's the obvious answer. It ought to be a four-year cycle. I don't know what you mean. Rather than a three-year cycle. And then, it, and then you add more time you mean four in. four-year for the school visits. Right, right. So that your, your expect, so you've added a whole extra year or a half a year or something. But you, what you demand of reporting in each individual meeting shortens and it gives you more time to build in time for. Yeah. The other thing I would say is I think there's a certain number of hours per year that the board might be able to spend. And I think treating the hours as homogenous, meaning adding half an hour to each board meeting, is one solution to spend to increase in the total number of hours the board spends talking about something every year. Another way would be to add an additional retreat or two additional retreats and to me, I guess we've talked about this a few times over the last several years, and to me, the idea of keeping the regular meetings business-focused and, and you know, pretty, pretty focused and, and um, short would be, I would rather have the rhythm of short, focused business meetings and then more kind of open-ended, interactive, in-depth, special uh, retreat meetings I, rather than just adding half an hour per meeting. I like that proposal. Um, I would like to make a totally different proposal to the board. 
I'd like to leave this as a first reading and let it hang. Um, and I'd like to ask the board for permission to cap the meetings at four hours through the end of May and only through the end of May and then revisit uh, whether, an, and, and I will not use the four hours if we don't absolutely crazy need it. And, and it would leave the language of trying to aim for a three hour meeting, but I can tell you now that, that Tim and I have already looked at those agendas, that's not happening. So if I could get your permission to have up to four hours through the end of May for the regular meetings, and then we can revisit as a board whether we wanna just leave the policy alone and have considered that a short term thing or if we want to come back to this policy. Does anyone have a feeling on that? I think for what you're proposing, structurally, it probably would make more sense to withdraw this first reading and then bring it back for first reading after the end of May if you still want to do that. So put the, um, put the logistics aside for a second because I have a comment on that. Are you good with the proposal? In the spirit I'm good of with like the proposal for expanding the meetings in April and May to four hours, if necessary. Potentially the second one in March, but I think we got that one down. Did we get that one I down? I think we did. Yeah, I think we got that down. But from now through the end of May, the ability to choose uh, to schedule up to four hours. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to make a motion that the board will allow meetings to be scheduled for up to four, regular meetings to be scheduled for up to four hours through the end of May this year. Before, so I guess a point of clarification, we've got the meeting planners here. Yep. And there's nothing on here that right now suggests a need for that. The second meeting in March is currently listed as two hours and 50 minutes. So is there a lot of stuff that's not shown on the planners? I wonder if that's not up to date because when Tim and I were talking, it was a lot more. I suspect there's an issue with that. Well, I think we pulled um, the community partner reports plan got pulled off this meeting, would that go? Yeah, that'll But that was only that 15 one. minutes. Yeah, that's not gonna be huge. Yeah, I think as, as we were looking farther out and what was coming and what we would hold off, so looking at, at April and April May. April and May, I thought were particularly the, the challenges. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I've put a motion out there. Is there someone willing to second it? I second it. Okay. Steve, you have additional comments for the discussion about it? Uh, no, I just asked my question, that was it. Okay, well, you, yeah, anything follow up on that? No. Okay. Any other comment? I mean, the only thing I would say is if second meeting in March is two hours and 50 minutes. Then pull something into it. Yeah. Yeah, we certainly will do that if we can. So the goal will be to stick with the three hour max, le you know, the less the better so we can really get focused and have time. All right. Um, so the motion is out and seconded. I'm gonna call the question. All in favor of allowing the meetings to be scheduled for up to four hours through the end of just May this year. Aye. 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 All right, so it's five, we're set. Um, as far as removing this from second reading, uh, I, I think this is such a small change that it's not worth doing two more readings. So if we decide we wanna go ahead with it and we've had the experience, it doesn't seem like it would be worth two more meeting times, so I would rather just call this the first reading and leave it alone, and then we can either put it to bed and say we're not gonna change it at the end of May, or we can say we'll look at this uh, for a second reading in, and kind of put it out there. Does that sound okay, or do you have a, is that fundamentally upsetting? I don't, I mean, that's a departure from the way we've done other policy first and second readings. We've normally done those at consecutive meetings. The idea of with, uh, delaying the second reading for an indeterminate amount of time seems like it's a little bit of a weird ad hoc arbitrary departure from what we've done before. I think it'd be cleaner to just withdraw it and bring it back. Does anyone else have strong feelings about this? Doesn't seem worthy of our meeting time. Great, I'm gonna just withdraw this in the honor of moving our meeting forward and we'll just go ahead and we can do a double meeting to change it later if we need to. So that one's done. That takes us to the superintendent search checkpoint. Um, is that all right? Anyone have anything else on that? Great. So we're at the search checkpoint and I promised at our last meeting that I would have the script ready in case there were any points to review there. And I do have two points to review, but I wanna let the committee see what they need to use this time for first. 
Yeah, so we need a um, couple of things for sure. One is um, you have this set of questions which takes the revisions that everybody agreed to on Sunday. Um, and uh, so I think the desire was for me to bring these back just so that I think you, I'm not sure if you wanted to make sure I made the edits correctly or what. But anyway, there are these here. I don't think there's any reason to discuss them unless somebody sees something that doesn't match what you thought was going to happen. It says exec session at the top. It should say executive session questions at the top. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, the way this is highlighted makes it look like we're going to talk about this in executive session, which it we're not. Badly. Yeah. So anyway, unless somebody sees something on there that doesn't match what you thought you were agreeing to on Sunday, there's no discussion needed on this. The more substantive issue that we need to get the board uh, to uh, agree on is following the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday semi or finalist days, we have to have a special meeting at some point to actually select the next superintendent. Um, the, uh, when we did this in 2012, we did interviews Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Then there was Memorial Day weekend, and we met on the following Tuesday to make the decision. Um, Ryan from RNA is extremely unenthusiastic about delaying that amount of time. Uh, he would ideally, <coughs> I think he would ideally like us to make the decision Friday night. I told him that because of the community involvement piece of this that it would just be impossible for us to we need to give the community time to weigh in and give feedback and watch the videos and stuff so um so Could you say again how much time we did last time we ended on thursday we met in special meeting on tuesday but we had a holiday weekend in the middle um so um chris's and my recommendation is that we meet on sunday um and, that, and then declare a deadline for comments, which Elizabeth will have to post, but the deadline would then be like Saturday night at midnight or something like that, um, which gives the community 24 hours to watch the videos and weigh in. Um, and Ryan's recommendation on this was that if we get, if we delay more than 24 to 48 hours after the last day of the interviews, that that is um, a kind of unusual amount of time for the board to delay to make a decision. Um, I think one thing that the board should be aware of is that none of the candidates are considering other positions actively. So we're not in any sort of a time race against any other district that is going to be potentially hiring one of these candidates away. Uh, so that, that is not really a consideration. Uh, apparently for one of the candidates there's some upheaval going on with replacing that candidate and the organization that candidate is with would really like as much time as possible. Ryan was very focused on that particular issue. I personally wasn't sure how much difference 24 hours might make on that. Um, so anyway, the, Chris's my recommendation is Sunday is number one and Monday is number two. Monday's so my I have, preference. I have a question. I have a question for staff, um, specifically around our community engagement. We, we as a board, uh, really value that um, that input from our community, and and even if staff put out there the end of community input is say midnight of Saturday, could you would you be able to tally all those input up and make it available for board if board choose to meet on Sunday? So that's just a matter of running the report Sunday morning, yeah. So I have a comment, a reaction to this. We are asking our staff to be on, on call basically 6.45 a.m. to 10 p.m., three days in a row. I, I don't see the reasonableness of asking them to then do prep work on Saturday evening and then come in and work on Sunday, Sunday. morning. I, I don't understand why we can't just do it on Monday. And I, I think we're also going to be blowing off our families completely for three days, plus we're not there tonight. So we, we're like... Two weeks. Uh, it, yeah, so which I, I just don't so understand. So if we do it Monday, the, we should do it Monday morning. That's... I have a meeting that I can reschedule. I'd be happy to do that. I mean, it's, it's fine with me. That then you're saying let everyone just let the data flow in as it does and then Monday morning Elizabeth can like if we meet it. at 9 or 10 
they can start at seven or eight and get the data together and get everything so they're not working all weekend mm -hmm. and the community has the whole weekend to watch the videos. Does it lose us a candidate? I mean, I'm not interested in trying to take that chance. I just, I'm not sure oh, I no, see I, that. It doesn't seem like it. There's not, you know, yeah. there are other scenarios in other possible universes where there would be other districts that were actively, you know, where the candidates were interviewing in other districts, but that's not the scenario we're dealing with this time. And, and I think that whatever we decide we're going to do, then that will be relayed back to the candidates. Yeah, and I think that's wondering. the important piece. If, yeah. if, it's just if you're up front the, where the search consultant can say to the candidates, the board intends to finalize their decision Monday morning, we'll contact Monday afternoon, mm -hmm. then they know that. So yeah. that they're not... And I think especially if, so I already communicated to Ryan that the reason that we wanted to delay to at least Sunday was because of the, the degree to which we value the community input. And Ryan's response was, that's important. I need that to be able to explain to the candidates why there's going to be more of a delay. So I think he's already got the and rationale that he needs. There is one other reason that I think it would be super helpful. Last time when we were in our debates and making our decisions, it was exceedingly helpful to be able to ask follow-up questions of staff. And so we have a higher chance, a hit rate, of being able to contact mm. the staff member or the union president and saying, hey, you guys sent us this feedback. Could you clarify this? Mm -hmm. Or you know, and all the groups that are meeting independently, we can get clarification. We can get. Yeah. So that's my, that's my present. The other thing I don't know and that Ryan didn't talk about was what impact that has on his availability or travel schedule. Are we able to utilize the assistance of Bob? No, Ryan has, Ryan thinks, Ryan will come no matter what. He's the only one that actually really knows the candidates. Bob had not actually, you know, he's just a good listener who is a, kind, a person who absorbed our, you know, our uh, considerations and was a good was a good foil yeah. for us to talk off but of. But we could potentially, Ryan if Ryan's available. not available on Monday, we could potentially say it would be helpful to have yeah, Bob and, here. And I don't think there was ever a question of whether, I don't think we ever even asked. And we realized when the question came up that we had not talked among ourselves who was available Saturday, who was available Sunday, who was available Monday. So we kind of had this big hole in our planning. So mm -hmm. if we're all saying we're available Monday, then I was trying to remember we what we did last that. time. And I thought we had done it the last night. I was like, did we just stay through? That doesn't sound right, because right, we had all these conversations. Yeah, well, and Ryan, when he first asked that, he said, so I'll come in Friday night, and then we'll, you'll work through this. And it was like, wow, no, you know what? This is a new thought. And then we started this conversation. But this is the first time we're all together. To all right, so up. Monday morning at 10? Yeah. Um, sure. They don't need much time. They just need to press the report button in Survey Gizmo, and that's about it. So we can declare the comment period to be done by like um, 7 a.m. Monday or something like that. Yeah. Okay. We can't know. It could take two hours. It could take 50 hours. Yeah, maybe we should start at 9. Yeah, I mean, that is the why other why thing about going to Monday is people's work schedules and other schedules. Yeah. That's fine. So as far as community <laughs> input, is it, is, it, is it better to say by midnight of Sunday or is it better to say by 7 o'clock on Monday? I mean, I don't know. Why don't we just, it doesn't but, matter. But, but we'll leave it. Yeah. So we meet at 9 on Monday morning. Does that work, Elizabeth? Are there any constraints that that would break on you? Sounds good to me. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so we're nine o'clock Sunday, Monday morning, March thirteenth. Okay. And then we need a we need a space.
Carey. Oh, gosh, where might we meet? Oh, the Faker Room. How about some place with super comfortable chairs? <laughs> we'll just sit in the chairs yeah. that will now be have our permanent impressions. We'll know which chairs belong to us. That's right. Because they'll be based on... Yeah. Chris, did we have anything else we needed for tonight? Oh, um, so if everybody's, if everybody is um, okay with the questions, I will print out questions in the morning. Will um, you renumber them and stuff? Session. What? You'll renumber them and all that. I will renumber them. Or put names. And you, are you going to assign names to them? Yes. That would be helpful. Yes. Thank you. Um, um, Elizabeth printed this for us. These are three pieces. The uh, it's yours. It's your. Uh, Thank you to the. Uh, so each take one. There, so each, you take one from each paper clip. To, okay. So it's the final schedule. It's the welcome to the observer panel, and it's the. It is the observer panel. Missing one name, it, but the rest of them are awesome. there. Awesome. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So Elizabeth. so so my plan is to bring um, a bunch of. I assume Jeff and or Elizabeth are printing out the short form feedback forms for the community forums and the staff and so on. So I was just going to bring the longer form feedback forms for the board, and which is the questions with space to write notes. Awesome. And then if you want the um, shorter form, the, like the one page ones with the leadership profile on them, um, I can either bring a bunch. I mean, I'm going to be printing other stuff anyway, or we can get some from staff, it doesn't matter. I would like to have one handy. Whatever is the easiest way to provide right. that I'll is print fine. Some just, I'll print some just to make sure that I have some. Okay. okay. Um, so I have two process questions or two protocol questions that I just want to clear with everyone so I can finish the script. Okay, so I was just going to tell you guys the pieces that maybe you've caught on to or not, but the first candidate, the first and second candidates have arrived tonight, and the uh, one who is going to be interviewed tomorrow is going to hang over and do tours on Thursday, and the one that's going to be interviewed on Thursday arrived today so that they could do tours tomorrow. Oh, cool. And cool. so both, and then the third candidate is unable to get here until at the crack of dawn Friday and has made a request that Elizabeth is working on the details for of uh, doing some things on Saturday. So she's found things in schools. Okay. There's apparently a, something going on at the International School of Production at 2 o'clock on Saturday. Hmm. And so that person is going to hang over on Saturday because of the desire to get into schools. Awesome. Yeah, so thank you to Elizabeth. That's, again, that was Another weekend all her, on her part. Those were all details that she was sorting out. All right. I have two quick questions if I can ask them. So during the interviews uh, that the board has, there, was, uh, there were two questions that came up when I was working on the script uh, with Steve, and I just want to bring them back to you guys because we had a difference of opinion, and I wanted to just make sure that the will of the board would preside or what have you. So the one question is, do we want to give the candidate a chance in either session, probably the closed one if we were to do it, uh, to ask their own question, like we did. Do you have any questions for us kind of thing? Or do we want to not give them a time to ask questions because we feel like they'll have informal time to ask those questions? Um, I, I can present either argument to you. You can ask Steve and I to present our own arguments, but I'd just kind of like to get an objective sense of where the rest of you stand. You know, I think in some ways it is significant in a, in a new way to, you know, starting tomorrow because they will have met with everybody before we see them. And uh, then they may. They may have things they want to ask because of the community. For, of any, they won't have met of, with the BEA reps yet. Because of any of that. Right. They will have met with, that's right. That's one still coming up. But they yeah. will have met yeah, with all in the, the afternoon. And they will have had one community forum. One. Mm -hmm. So here's my thought. Um, we, we talked about it. We are going to have dinner with the candidate. And, and we did say that, oh, you know, during dinner it's probably, it can be light um, or not. It's, it can be organic. Um, but going through this semi-finalist interview, I feel that um, we shouldn't offer that. Uh, I should, or should not. Should not for the, the candidate to ask questions during the formal interview. And if, if the candidate... When you say the formal interview, you mean either of the formal interviews? Either of the formal okay. interview. Um, and if, if there's something really nagging the candidate and, and they feel like they really need it to know, I feel that the, uh, the time when they have dinner with us, they could, it could come out. Okay. Carolyn? 
you're entitled to whatever opinion I'm either sorry, way. I, 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 I have to admit, I kind of spatially lived through a gutter to admit my documents and views on the panel. So um, the same reason I asked questions during dinner and not during the uh, uh, no, 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 interview. No, 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 no. Allowing yeah, candidate to yeah, ask, ask us questions. questions. Are you asking what I? That's what you guys were saying. That's, okay. our, uh, no, what we're, that's that was one of the proposals. The question is, should we? So there's a position that they have the time to ask the questions during informal interactions. There's a position that informal interactions should be just that, and that they should get time to ask their question during the formal interview, so that there is some back and forth, and that there is a respect of them as a player in the game. So. And I guess to clarify my position, um, my position is not that I don't think the candidate should ask any questions. My position is I don't like the structure of asking our set of core questions and then having each board member ask one question and then using whatever time is left over, which could be two minutes or it could be 30 minutes, to let the candidate ask questions. That's the part of it I don't like. If, it, if we, I mean, I think my, first preference would actually be to say when we get to you know 10 minutes left or 15 minutes left or something like that at that point no matter how many questions the board has asked at that point we say okay it's your turn do you have any questions for us so that we basically time box the questions they have equally among the different candidates and then that might mean that the board asks spontaneous questions maybe we ask three spontaneous questions of one and maybe we ask 10 of the next one depending on how I would feel better about that than about giving no questions to the candidate. I feel like we had an inconsistency in the questions the candidates got, and they didn't get ant like several of them had more they wanted to ask, but they ran out of time, and some had too much time, and so forth. So I, I like time boxing it. Um, I don't think it needs a huge time box. I think five so to like, seven minutes might be enough, maybe ten at the most. I think so. Ten? I think that takes us back to. You know, do we just let one board member answer the question, or are multiple board members going to weigh in? And if you time box it at five to seven minutes, then that means basically, probably we're going to have one question oh, from the yeah. candidate. So only one board member. So, so I personally would, if I were, if we were going to do that at all, I would say fifteen. If we're going to do that, I I would agree with Steve. I still think that as far as consistency. Um, during the interview, I, I would still prefer not having that option uh, based on what we experienced during our semi-finalist uh, experience. So it's not random? It's I, not, it's, I, th it's I think when, you're going to end up. Are done, we're done. I think you're going to end up in the same level of inconsistency in the sense that some of them are going to get way more questions, spontaneous questions from us than others, depending on when they end. So it will be inconsistent regardless, but we can help the consistency by time boxing it. Yeah, and I think too there's, you know, there is a progression of formality that needs to happen, I think, in an engagement like this where if we end up coming across like robots but at the end of a really full day because we've so overly structured the process, that's not helpful in recruiting the person that we actually like the most. And so the idea that we need to open up some space, I mean, I think a, a reasonable way to look at it is that it progresses from more formal to somewhat less formal over the course of the day. Um, so if we were to go in this direction, 15 questions, then we do the spontaneous questions until we're 15 minutes out from the end, and we stop them, we invite the candidate to ask questions, and then we wrap up when there's a minute left. I like it because it's the 15-15 plan. You'll have one more chance at getting a turn because we have one more session with them, an open session, where the board members will also get to ask probably one spontaneous question. Well, there's a community observer panel after that, and you That's what I was meaning. Yeah. So that's that not, is not, not an open that's session, not open though. session. Oh, sorry, Executive sorry, not open session. session. Executive yeah. session. There's one more. And so you will still get a chance to ask your own question. So, so you ask and there's, so you have that one that we can ask in exec session, and you have the community observer panel where you can feed a question right. if you need to. All right, so it sounds like we are converging converging enough that you know the center of gravity is 15, 15, 15 plan. Well, for clarifications, 
that is if the candidate ended up answering that question really quickly to the point where they have that 15 no. minutes left. No. No, it's like they just didn't think. No. Yeah. So wherever they are, we've only got, I mean, we've got two hours for the executive session part. So, you know, we had, what, 12 questions for the, for the, for the semi-finalist interviews, and that was in an hour. Oh, yep. And so now we've got 15 in two hours, so, and then some indeterminate number of spontaneous board member questions. So I think we'll have 15 minutes left for every candidate. So the variable amount remains the number of spontaneous questions. It was that, it stays that. Yeah. Got it. Okay. okay, so that's done. The other question is, um, can we take the first minute or not, should we take the first minute or not of the community panel closed observer interview to have each um, candidate just say their name and I represent the teachers or I represent the each PPSA. Observer panel member. Sorry, that's what I meant, yeah. yeah. Tim, do you know if the observer panelists introduced themselves to you or not, or if they just sat there as a quiet block? So I always think It's not one minute, though, because there are 11 of no, them. No, they don't get one minute. It, we take, like... It wouldn't be one minute total, because there are 11 of them, so it's five seconds apiece. It's going to take longer than that. Live because um, we're starting the session with them like five to ten minutes early. They're, they're told to come in so that they're all seated. We have something we read to them, so we're not using up the time on that. Yeah, just whatever group you represent, and then that's it. Are people comfortable with that? Because I know there's a time concern. It is only one hour. I think you have to be crystal clear that we just want name and group you represent. That's it. This group has that. If and you so, see and so, the I way I would say, may, I might, the way we might start that then on day one, we won't need it on day two and three. But the way we might start on day one is by having the board members set the example. But that means the board members have to be disciplined in saying, "I'm Steve McConnell. I'm a board member, not I represent District One. I have two kids of right, school age. Yeah, it's just I'm Steve it. McConnell. I'm a board member." Oh, I didn't really. I I didn't. Do we introduce ourselves? Yeah. No, I'm saying to set the example Good for, model the, at the, first for the observer panel. Uh, it's fine. Well, is the yeah. person in the chair? They're probably going to end up in chairs across the back of the room. I don't know if they'll have tables yeah. or not. Yeah. We can't count on it. Yeah. So, all right, great. Those are the two pieces I needed input on. Unless anyone wants to uh, micromanage, I will <laughs> finish that task with Steve so that there's two of us and it's not just one, and I'll make sure that at least somebody's looked at it and said this isn't crazy. And you've heard my concern, which is people left to their own devices will, you know, I mean, I've seen cases where the first person's a little long and introduce themselves, and the second person gets oh. more detail, and the third person gets more detail We're going to tell them we have, we're still. tight on time. It, 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 the script actually says that. We're tight on time. We need you to say your name and who you, who you represent, the group you represent. Well, I hope most of us know some of these folks. Okay, are there any other protocol things that we have to talk about? Because one of the things I think is important is uh, our, like, uh, being clear, I added a piece to the script that gives the community panel some information because they've never done executive sessions. So what's expected of them mm -hmm. to make sure that we create a safe environment so that each of them can share and not feel like the other person's gonna go like broadcast to the community everything that they've said, like it has to be a safe space. Um, but it also, we're asking them as part of this, safe, this space to help us keep our community objective to all three candidates. So we're gonna ask them to make sure that they don't talk about um, the work until the selection is made. So if, uh, I just wanted to clarify if that is our expectation of each other. I, I know that we all have a right to talk and say whatever we want, but it's nice to have an informal agreement that, that we're gonna try to keep this process objective. And, and, and not only that, I think, I think it's important that we know that this is in executive session. And so, and so I, I, looking at the name, I, I mean, I don't know, I, I, I think as we communicated with the individual who presented on, in the panels, it would probably be clearly understood. Okay. So are we in general agreement that we're not gonna 
to talk about candidates outside, like we'll let people know it's happening. We the board. Yeah, we the board mm -hmm. as individual members, that we will, you know, refrain from from giving our personal opinions about candidates until the process is over. Uh, none of us can govern this. It's not enforceable. It's just an ask to help keep That's the integrity of the process. Yeah. Yep, but we didn't all, like, so is everyone in on that? Are we, are we good with that? Okay. Yeah. And, and I think what we said last time And especially, time, anything, obviously, I mean, just public. At, at the risk of stating the obvious, anything on social media, there shouldn't be, uh, there shouldn't be a trace of anything other than, please wow, it was a long forums. day or something, you know, looking forward to tomorrow or something like or that. Or please come to the Defense. forums. Yeah. You can put that out as many times as yeah. you want. Yeah. Um, yeah, I want to just say, like, we have worked very hard on the integrity of this process. We didn't advance, announce candidates to anyone. We waited till Elizabeth put them up for every single group, even the groups who are, like, part of our org who, like, wanted to do research and get going. And, like, we waited. We didn't pre-announce to the press. I think we should keep the integrity of our process as sound as we could. Yep. All right. That's my thing. Until the end of Monday. Is it till what? Well, end of Monday, but also keep in mind that, you know, probably we, no, it's not, that's not complete because what needs to happen is the search firm will contact whoever we select. That person needs to accept the offer and if for some reason that person declines the offer, we do not want the second person we contact to know that they were our second choice, so. And then the other part but is my point is we shouldn't say anything even after we think we're done. We need to wait until we get confirmation acceptance from a of the offer confirmation from the candidate. And and even after that point, executive session is still executive session. If you want to keep our spaces safe, we don't have very many reasons we're allowed to be in executive session. There are very few. And when we're there, it needs to be a safe space. And even it needs to be a safe space for the candidates who put themselves on the line. Mm -hmm. So you can talk about impressions, but you shouldn't be like, if somebody shared something with you in confidence, then that was shared with you in confidence. All right, um, we're supposed to talk about planning a candidate forum because two of our positions are up for election in this next year. And, and we, um, we have one board member who, unless she has changed her mind, thinks she's not coming back. So we, we know we at least need one person, and there may be others who are interested. So, um, we don't. We, it doesn't matter. We just we just know that people need to sign up. So, if that's the case, do we want to have a forum for them? Okay. So, uh, planning for that. by the three of you. Milan and Chris would not attend because, in, in general, we've taken the practice. Oh, that's right. We've taken the practice of, of discouraging people who will be running oh, for election from showing up. You don't mean when you know who the candidates are. No. You, oh, oh, no, no, no. I, I, I thought you meant that. I thought it's a little early with the election in November. Oh, that's no, no. An open that. forum for you candidates to, to ask questions. People. And to ask questions and, and, to and get give information. Them information. Yeah. So we need to set a date for that. And that would probably be in what, what is the date by which they have to file? Do we have that handy? May 19th. That's the last day. So we want to have so this April. April, April is, is, is when we should have the forum. Okay. Do we want to set a date? Do we want to do it like just after one of the oh marathon meetings? Maybe not. <laughs> Although that might be the easiest way to get us all together to say like, let's do a 7:30 forum or an 8 o'clock forum. No, is that, that a bad off, idea? That seems kind of late compared to what we've done. Oh, what have you done in the past? Before, I mean, normal. I think in the past we've done like seven or something like that. Okay. Um. Great. Um, I think we're done. Uh, the last day. Last day. So they want to know <laughs> before the first day. I have personally have conflicts on April 10th and 11th, so I'd ideally like to not have it on those days. Okay. Um, and the 20th. I think we should not do it the week of the 10th because that is spring break and people who are interested oh, may be with, off with their kids. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder about, what days did you say you could not do? Well, if we take out the week of the 10th, then it's just the 20th I can't do. How about 4, 5, or 4, 6? 4, 5 is our board meeting, right? No, no. 4, 4, four, is, our four, four is, is the board, board meeting. meeting. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, either one. 
Yeah. And it's, I wonder, I mean, do we want to have it a little closer to the actual filing date, maybe? I don't know. I was thinking earlier might be helpful. Is yeah, I don't know. If uh, earlier is not helpful, I could do. I think earlier is helpful. 20th. I really I think. think earlier is helpful because if somebody choose to run, yep. and especially if somebody choose to run, oppose with an opponent okay. to have that time to prepare himself for campaigning is important. Okay. I mean, there's, I'm, people can still run, that people can run oppose me, so they need to know right. how they can campaign themselves. And, and learning how to campaign is important to have all that time. And we can still be as accessible as a board. We can have a post up there with a link to get more information, to ask questions, whatever. Yeah. Um, so I'd so I would, I would, I would kind of prefer April 6th to the 5th, just to avoid two school board no. evenings so in a row. But How late do those go? Eight hmm. or later. I mean, they, they're crazy. They start as slow, they go forever. I can do either day. So whatever works for the two of you, I will make it work. The fifth can, I don't have a conflict on the sixth. I mean, either day, so. Okay, and I, so then let's do the fifth. the fifth. Carolyn's I requesting the fifth. the fifth. And I'm looking at the fifth, and I know it's supposed to be this game. One night, my kid has to go to South Dakota, but I don't think that involves him. So, and we don't know what, not yet. So that would work, I think. Okay, so let's do 7 p.m. on the fifth. Um, here, I assume. Terry, could you send an invite to the to the whole board? Me, Lynn will probably just decline it, but at least we can just send it out, get it on the calendar, get a meeting notice, get a room. So I'm going to call the Terry, Terry, Terry and, 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 and have Elizabeth on board with it to right. communicate out. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> and I will actually, I will be out of town that week, oh. but you don't need me there for that, so that's okay. I'm going to miss that board meeting as well. Okay. But okay, you don't need to email. Chris, can we give them your contact info if they want to ask about the district or? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> I have a dog and pony show. I can't <laughs> do the 19th. <laughs> um, and Steve can't do the 20th. So I think this is our week. So I think we're in. Yeah. All right. Seems and good. we haven't had huge attendance at them. So I think the real thing is to start the conversation, to get it out there that we're like mm -hmm. looking and that, that we have so resources but for is people. It bad if the incumbent can't do that? We had a good turnout um, so four years ago, though. We had like, well, there was we one had I like went to that had a good people or something. Four was that years the one ago. we had in there? Yeah. Yeah, that wasn't a we bad turnout. A pretty, the one I went was pretty packed mm -hmm. of okay. people. Um, no, not the incumbent, uh, Carolyn. The reason Chris there is because Chris don't plan to, re right, to run for re-election. Maybe since she does have this opportunity, she could be there and she could talk to the person about exactly So what So could you. I think that that is true. She could do that. It doesn't work out very easily for dates, and I don't think it's worth like trying to find right. a different well, date. Plus, if they show up and they think that means they have to serve for 14 years, that might scare them <laughs> off. That's right. All right. That's right. So we are... All this gray hair yeah. that I'm now letting show. <laughs> I want to keep this. I I've stopped keeping track of time, and that's not good because we're, we're getting late here. Quite. Um, <clears throat> we're having fun. We have the... Pl so we've planned the date, comments. right? And Terry, you'll send that out tomorrow, the, the calendar piece. All right. Um, you will have and you'll, so and, much. Is Terry, are you going to follow up with Elizabeth, or do you want one of us to follow up with her? Thank you. Yes. Next week, week after. Yeah, okay. Um, planning for upcoming equity session. So uh, we had some discussions about this already, and uh, I didn't put a, a thing in there, but I've got all sorts of brainstorming stuff reflecting the notes we had from the last time we met. Uh, we had a planning discussion about this, I think, two meetings ago. Mm -hmm. So this, I think, reflects some of those ideas. What are we going to do with our hour on racial equity? What materials, background stuff do we want? And what kind of discussion do we need to have? Sometimes we as a board need a discussion that's open to just sort of get us exploring an area in greater depth. And sometimes we need a focusing point, like an object that we're trying to accomplish so that we can actually make the, the project the, the issue accessible to us. Because if we're all out in theoretical land and we're all on different pages, sometimes we don't, we don't get to the right, to a productive place. And I'm not honestly sure exactly where we're at. 
So here are the background pieces I thought we would likely be able to have available. We can get an update from Shamari, who's been meeting on equity issues with different staff groups, parent groups, and student groups. So we can have a concise written summary from him. We can have a three minute presentation from him. We can have a 10 minute, we could have nothing. But that's one source of information that I think is useful to have. Carolyn and I have attended, between the two of us, several meetings with students at Newport. Um, individual students as well as the Black Student Union. We could give you a very brief update about some of the takeaways from that. Um, we could get the data, and there are many slices of data that Elizabeth or others could pull together for us and have accessible so it were grounded in reality. And we could, um, and I did want to remind us that we have three relevant asks on the table two of which I think are moving on their own and don't need a whole meeting of our focus. One is the discipline procedures. Patty's working on that. I don't think that's the place for us to dig in deep because there's a whole group working on it. There's a, an ask for our curriculum materials to be in better shape. I think we can touch on that issue, but I don't think we're the experts to dive deep on the curriculum at this time with what's available to us. Um, and there is work being done. Uh, equity policy, that's an ask that has come back again and again and again for a couple of years. The board seems to finally be interested and a community group or two have come together and put together a proposal that Shamari has worked on with John and so forth. I don't know that that's the best, like a comprehensive community way of building the proposal, but that is something that we could talk about. Maybe how could we get to a proposal? So the, this is what I've got. What would you guys like to do with this time? Could I also add into the space to be considered? <clears throat> is um, when we went to legis legislative conference, um, we had an equity caucus uh, from WASTA, and one piece that I I felt it was it was it was good for me, and it was good for many of those who attended that equity caucus, was that they pull a a, a policy. Do you remember, Chris, what policy it was? I, yeah. I can have it. But basically, they pull a policy that currently sitting in uh, Tumwater School District. And um, I don't know if you each, we each, has uh, received a um, bookmark sending from WASDA with the questions um, guiding us. I think it's five questions from Portland Public Schools guiding us um, as a lens of equity to look through, and so we use those five questions, and we read the, uh, the, the current policy at uh, Tom Water School District, and we did an exercise of reading the policy, look through, uh, asking those questions that we, was uh, on that bookmark, and um, to me that was quite an interesting exercise. Would you propose that we do that with the draft materials that are available in our district, or would you propose that we do that with an, a totally separate district just to orient us to thinking about that kind of policy? I would do it with our own policy, um, and, and I, I would propose that the policy committee would pick any policies that we have. Request is that if it, it could be relatively short because. Oh, sorry, you're not picking an equity policy. You're no, 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 any policy, any policy and, an equity lens and using equity lens, using those five questions and look through our own policies and any policy. Let's hear from other folks about ways you might use that time or a thoughts you're having about this. I think you all have better formed thoughts about how to use this time than I do. I, I'm happy to go whatever direction the rest of the board wants to go on this one. Chris? Um, it's an interesting idea, what you're suggesting. We could even just use that policy because that is a model policy that everybody has, right? And I, I, I've got it. I'm sitting on my desk at home. Um, uh, Send it to me. Yeah. I will try to find a comparable policy that's our own, because I agree with me, Lynn, that if we're not if we're not looking at an, an equity policy per se, if we're just looking at policies, the most fruitful thing to do is look at our own our own work. So I would like to find one, but I assume they chose one that happens to have rich aspects. So it might tip me off as to where I can look yeah. in ours. Yeah, well, and, and you know, the reveal was that oh, well, no, nobody meant that, but you know, it was that. It was that moment, those moments where you recognize 
sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, no, right. You're giving out all the answers. Well, no, but that's No, that's pretty the, self-evident. That We're going to have aha the, moments about our policies. Right. That's the reason for the exercise, and it was, yeah. it was, uh, it was, it was useful. Powerful equity going, lens. Going through all the policies that way. <laughs> well, I hope so. Yeah. No, you guys can do it too. I believe in you. <laughs> yeah, I think we can, and I think we should. I think that's a great idea. Um, do you think that that exercise? Um, what do you want for takeaways from this? Because to me, that's that's like an opening educational activity for the board to have some aha and awareness moments but it doesn't ground us in next steps. Do you, is that as much as you want from this one hour discussion or do you want another step out of it? I honestly don't know what, 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 what we, the board, um, get out of it. I, uh, I know that exercise was slated for 15, 20 minutes. Um, they gave the people who participated an opportunity to express how they felt. Uh, in, the, in the exercise, there were students uh, who participated. So I would leave it as organic as it could be. I think it would be for our own journey as well. So I, I think I would ask that if we were going to do that exercise, that we also include a brief conversation about possible next steps we'd like to take with the equity policy. Because that's been drafted, presented to our staff, and, and there's a push to get us to, to move on that. And I, I don't know, I think that that policy is not something about just getting a policy through to take care of an issue. That's one that has to be embraced by a community. So I think having us have a short conversation about how we'd like to proceed with that might be wise. Well, that's kind of the question. Yeah. Is our goal of the equity work session? My well, view, more educated, my view of the, the board's place on the racial equity priority is that we don't have a very grounded or consistent view that's, that's um, convergent. We all have noble, good ideas that are well-intended, but they're not, they're not grounded necessarily in action and they're not convergent. So if we as a board want to make any progress, there is value in us taking a concrete exercise to focus on something. So in this case, we'd focus on policy. And at the end of that, my hope would be we would start to develop a lens that we could, we could use, that any one of us could use, not just me, Lynn, that would be used. And I don't mean like documenting a, 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 a huge tool, but just start to have a shared lens of how to look at a policy in a way that's inclusive and and like wake us all up because I'm sure each of us will learn something from the exercise. And then the second thing would be um, giving us another concrete thing our community has asked for. So this is something we're doing, board down. Mm -hmm. And then our community has asked us to look at another policy so that's ground up that we connect on okay. so that in two cases we make progress. But in both cases, the whole point is not just making progress on a thing, it's getting the board to converge or begin to converge. And you know, I would add to that, um, this, this, this progress that we've made has been under Tim's leadership. Tim came in, he had an understanding that whatever we were trying to do before in this space of closing gaps, that we needed a Department of Equity. We didn't have one before. And, and then that has evolved and that work has evolved and we have backed everything he's done. Um, and we have stepped into that space ourselves and tried to become partners in that work. Um, and now we get, so we realize this whole, all this work has been done under Tim's leadership and Tim is about to leave us. So I think it is a very good idea as we take on a new leader that we clarify that we are in this space ourselves. 
and this is what this kind this is the expectation we have that we will have a leader who understands that who who understands we are a board that has a equity policy that we expect everything to be done to be looked at through an equity lens and therefore because of that we have an equity policy this is a logical follow through so and it just kind of follow and not let it seem um, like it was it was a, it was a it was Tim's baby or it was a it was a it was a thing we did for a while we think we've done that now we'll think about this again when we get data in another year no we're we're we've done this for a few years and we are now carrying this on with a new leader and, and make it we clarify that okay so here's my proposal since I, the question you asked Carolyn was really helpful um, I think getting us clear on where we're going so I guess my proposal is we'll do the exercise with a piece of policy. We'll do a discussion about the equity policy. And Milin, since she suggested it, and I, since I sort of took this on already, will go ahead and plan the hour session. So we will decide what subset of this background info to have available. We'll choose a policy. We'll, um, we'll just get material and, and yeah, and I think we'll want to have some folks on hand for us that night to support Yeah, I was us. just going to suggest, not, not to interrupt, but I yeah. think as you're talking through this, I think having the background information is there but not presented. It's given to you the week ahead, and, and oh, we, yeah. we can have it to you next week. Uh, so you have that information. That's just this backdrop that's there, but then we have individuals sitting here so that they're sort of your resources yeah. as you get into a conversation. But the, but the really, I like the idea of this convergence of the board. I think that's an important conversation because many of us have already been involved in the conversation. The board hasn't had any space to really begin that. In an hour, you're not going to get real far. Oh, we're going to save the world. But, uh, <laughs> but I think it will it'll help provide direction. And I think out of that, you may not be able to do this uh, on the 21st, but it will point you to say we have to have more discussion and these might be next steps as a board that we want to pursue. But I think having the staff available, have them just come up and sit up here for the conversation would be great. And I will try in the agenda planning to leave 15 minutes of cushion so that if this discussion is rich, that we this is one of the places where we said we'd stop and have a deeper discussion. So we would have a cushion to expand into without like going way over our, our time and stuff. And so we I'll are just try two to minutes build that and cushion. 50 seconds, or two hours and yeah, 15 so minutes Yeah, right so maybe we don't add to that. It maybe not add much. Shape. All right. So I think that gives us guidance. Is everyone comfortable with that? And this, actually, this discussion was already part of it. This is, it's useful. Okay. We're up for executive session. I'm wondering if we could take care of item 9 and 10 and then go into executive session and do 9 and 10 with only those critical items since we're so over um, based on multiple things going on tonight. Would people rather do exec session and then come back out? What's the preference? It's just always nice to end. I should have noticed that the exec session wasn't listed at the very end. I, I didn't. I'm sorry. So does anyone have a preference? Do you want to go now into exec session, or do you want to change the agenda order? Yeah, let's just do it now, and then Kevin at least can leave when we're done. OK. So if people want to hear the rest of this stuff, they'll have to wait. That's fine. And, and I've talked with Kevin, and we, we believe very strongly that 15 minutes will be okay. sufficient. If you have additional questions, he can do a, a follow-up with you. Okay, we will be back in here 15 minutes, so roughly 24 Seven after. 25? Sure, 25 after. 725. Sounds like a plan.